right good afternoon guys uh nice to meet you all once again it's actually a pretty i always get a pretty awesome energy whenever i come to like react bangalore meetup thanks a lot kiran for like organizing the meet and uh, how many of you guys uh, uh were part of my previous talk can you like can i get a show of hands okay cool so there is like a lot of new audience so what i was actually doing in the last uh, two talks basically i was like uh, doing like a series of uh sessions on how to like uh, optimize your uh, react application as you are like building so the previous talk uh the first session was about like uh, islands architecture so the whole idea behind the islands architecture is how you can add interactivity only to specific parts of your web application so there we discussed about astro next day is app directory and i think today also there's a astro js talk so it will be like really good and uh, there is a second talk was about ssr on the edge and uh, this talk actually covered all the rendering patterns that is like available in the react uh, ecosystem and we covered like certain uh, ssg ssr and uh, client side rendering all those and uh the talk basically like ends up with uh, saying why you should like do ssr on the edge rather than like a traditional node environment so the common thing among among this uh two talks is that both of them focus on like reducing the load on your application on the browser so if you look at uh, islands architecture it focus on reducing the amount of uh, javascript that you are like shipping to your users and if you look at ssr on the edge it focus on moving the complex logic out of the browser into your servers so that your application naturally has like lesser load and eventually it performs like really uh, better but there are like scenarios or uh, rare scenarios where you have to like build a very very javascript heavy applications on the client side and that in that scenario like islands architecture or ssr on the edge doesn't really make sense and this talk is actually targeting that specific category that's why it's like optimizing large applications because in usual normal applications where you are like building hundreds of components per uh, page you won't generally need much optimizations because react on its own with its virtual dom is like fast enough but this talk focuses on like understanding how that virtual dom works and what are the scenarios in which the virtual dom is actually like not good enough we have to think about further optimizations so it might go like little advanced and uh might cover topics that might not be like needed in your day to day development but anyway it's always fun to learn as we are like exploring new things so hope uh i will be able to like convey the concepts clearly cool so uh how many people here know what is virtual dom yeah this is a react meetup obviously everyone will know so i i just put a reference link there you can go and <laughs> refer what's a virtual dom we can skip over that but here is the thing virtual dom is fast for most cases until your users like start noticing a little bit of problem so usually what happens is in when you are like bootstrapping an app building a poc or like building a new product your application will perform really really fast you would think okay this is gonna scale really well but there will always be like a few pages in your application what will happen is whenever the user starts using that page and um, when you are whenever they are like doing a drag and drop or like some kind of animation is playing they will notice a small lag and the performance will start to be more noticeable as your team starts adding more and more components into the application because right now we build design systems and we have like different teams managing like different uh, products in the same application so what happens is you take a small paragraph that paragraph will have like hundreds of components within them like the bold text will be a single component then icon will be a one component even a small hyperlink will have its own component where on over you have like some pop ups and stuff showing up on the hyperlink and with the team size increasing what happens is the amount of dom elements will also concurrently start increasing and given you are building an app like google docs or give app like figma where the app has to be like an spa with like full single page experience for the whole user there is not much we can do with the highlands architecture or the ssr so what we actually have to do here is um there is a interesting blog written in swelt framework like 
virtual dom is a pure overhead so they will talk about how virtual dom is fast but technically it adds a lot of overhead to how you are like updating your javascript dom element okay so instead of like going over to the virtual dom and reading that blog i thought i'll make a very small app that explains how virtual dom is a overhead for your application okay and again since this talk focus on like building large applications to simulate performance issues i also had to build a very large application so i just split that into two part one i'll have a small application that tells why virtual dom is a overhead and another large application where virtual dom will actually perform really slow okay so let's start with the demo of our um, small application where i'll basically show you guys why virtual dom is considered a overhead as your application scales so this is the small application that i built so what this application has is it's a small animated box that just moves left to right and let me also show you how this box component is created so this box component is built using framer motion it's a nice library for building animations and what happens is i have an animate function here that repeats an animation infinitely where in each cycle it reverses the flow and this is the animation value so the animation value basically has transition across the x axis so the box transforms along the x axis as time passes so you will see that left to right movement now if you look at this values that i have added so what i did is when it renders i made sure this box is picking up random values between the values 20 50 -10 to +10 so every time the box is rendering it's going to render with a different animation value which means the animation will not look smooth as your box starts re-rendering so let me show you what it looks like now dragging the slider will basically like uh, edit the number that is inside that box so as i drag the slider you will see that animation basically starts like the box has like a flickering effect because the box is re-rendering and technically this number is the one that is supposed to change but since the number is supplied to the box as a prop if you see in the box is props the value that is inside is available as a prop and whenever it changes it forces the component to re-render cool and also it has a selected state so when i select it it turns red okay i'll tell you why i have this state so next what i'm going to do is i built a small catalog so what this catalog contains is it has like hundreds of such boxes and each of these box is going to have some value inside and i have an input field here so one input field is a range selector which is that uh, dragging interaction that i showed and another is going to be a text field which will let me select a specific box from the entire catalog of this animated boxes and what i did is i built a small context so this is kind of a pretty normal thing in react like whenever you want to like pass state across different components you build a context and you make sure these components can get the state updates from the parent without any need of prop drilling so just created a small context and using the context i can pass the selected value to the box so that the box knows okay i am the one that is currently being selected so this is how the application will look like now you see a whole catalog of all of these boxes animating by default the selected id is 0 now let me change it to 12 so the box number 12 has been like selected and when i am like dragging this slider technically what should happen is this box's value is supposed to change correct now if i look at my code also you will see i am using the context and i am giving a selected id and only if the id is selected i am passing the value to the box otherwise the box doesn't receive the value it only has the id which means technically other boxes are supposed to be unaffected correct but here's the problem with the react context what happens is so as i am like adding my value it will start re-rendering my entire dom does it make the application slow not exactly because it's a small app it needs a much bigger scale for you to like actually notice the difference but now what is actually happening is behind the scenes there is a he heavy dom computation going on so as i am like starting changing the value 
the application is behind the scenes computing in the virtual DOM. Should I need to like uh, re-render this DOM or not? Got it? And whenever it takes a call to re-render it on the virtual DOM, a re-render happens, but it is not applied to the DOM, which means the final end HTML element has not been affected. Still, there has been a computation that actually involved the entire application, which means somewhere on your JavaScript thread, a process is going on, and that process is taking up unnecessary uh, complexity. As your application is growing, these kind of complexities tend to compound. Cool? So this is the default behavior of context. Like there's like an ongoing thread, like how can we make context like a little faster so that the unaffected elements can be like optimized a little better. But trust me, don't use use memo. I just had this tab here just to tell you guys, don't use use memo. Because what I have seen many teams do is like put use memo on every place wherever they had to like avoid re-renders. But there is a hidden cost of having use memo because what happens in use memo is as you are like adding uh, dependencies and a calculated value, those values will start adding up to the memory complexity of your application rather than the th main thread complexity. So as your application is like increasing in size, the amount of memory complexity needed for each use memo also will start growing. And technically like re-render has been prevented, but the weight has just been like moved to a different place. You will run into a different kind of complexity by using use memo, use callback, pretty much any of these things. And large amount of use memo also means your code gets like little complex to maintain because developers have to be aware what are all the dependencies that use memo have to be like added, what dependencies need to be like removed. And in a large application, it gets out of hand eventually. So React team is actually working on a new compiler, which automates the creation of use memo internally. So over a period of time, this is going to be like completely taken care of by React team itself. But still, the new compiler also like falls short in like one uh, area. So this is a blog in builder.io where they are explained about React's upcoming compiler. So what they have mentioned is use memo is supposed to like uh, prune re-rendering and it actually works for most scenarios. But what happens is as your state is being prop drilled, when the parent component has to change, right, regardless of how much use memo you have, it will still lead to re-rendering. So this is a situation where I was like not able to create a perfect example for you guys to see. But I leave the blog post in the end of the presentation so you can go and give it a read. So how, how do we like solve this problem? So we know like we need to like re-render like only one box but kind of like re-rendering the entire uh, set of boxes. So what I did is I used a third party state management library. In this case, I'm gonna use a tool called Zustan. Zustand or Zustand, not sure how to pronounce it exactly. So Zustand has like a small section here that tells why you use Zustand over context. And here there is have a point saying renders components only on changes. So in Zustand we can be a little smart and make sure only the component whose prop is going to be changed can re-render and we can skip re-renders on all of those components. So I rebuilt the same catalog now. This time I built it with uh, the stand. Now the catalog will remain the same. It has the same input fields and the same simple box component. But one small change here is if you look at my box data, I have like four values in my the stand store. One is like an ID value and two setters for ID and the value. And the input field will use these setters and update the value. And when I am like getting the value, Okay, it has a redex selector kind of uh, syntax here. So what happens is I need the box data inside my animated box component. I'm like writing down. I need the box data, but I don't need the entire state. I only need the value of the state. So I'm returning it as state.value. And I'm also adding a condition here saying only if the ID is the selected ID of the box, then give me the actual value. Otherwise, just give me minus one. So now what happens is, as long as the ID is not the selected ID, it will always return minus one, which means a state re-render is not needed. But if it is a selected value, it will return the value that I have chosen on the store's state. Now let's look how the application behaves with 
zoo stand in its place. So this is the zoo stand version. Now let me select a, a different ID. Let me go with 16. Now, if I like to like change the value, what will happen is only that component will re-render. So here you can see by slightly like modifying how I am like passing the state across, I can actually like reduce a huge load on the virtual DOM, which basically like React has to do a state uh, DOM comparison only for that specific element. And in a real world scenario, these kind of optimizations go a long way because you might inadvertently like rendering a whole DOM tree of your React application and suddenly you limit your re-renders to a specific part of the DOM, the performance tends to be like extremely visible. But right now, uh, if you look at that uh, blog post that I shared, they did mention an another alternative on the right side after use memo saying there is a concept called signals. It can prune rendering and it can also like uh, take care of rendering even if the props have been like drilled through. So signals is a very new concept and also a very interesting one. This was introduced by a framework called SolidJS. And signals were known to be like extremely fast because unlike states, states are basically one value and one setter. So you pass the value down the DOM and you call the setter and React will re-render the entire DOM node. But the way signals work is it has a getter object and a setter function. So now what happens in signals is if you create a value out of a signal, that value itself is a function. That function can tell internally this is the DOM element I am situated in, which means for any change, make sure you are directly updating the DOM. So now we are kind of moving away from virtual DOM and starting to update the direct DOM. Kind of feels counterproductive, like aren't DOM updates supposed to be slow? That's why we created the whole virtual DOM. But here is the fun part. If you are doing a fine grain DOM update, like you know where the values are and you are exactly going to update the value on that DOM element, they tend to be much faster than the virtual DOM. So instead of reconstructing the whole DOM, like virtual DOM is like doing a diff and everything, instead of a good comparison I can say is instead of like searching through n elements in an array, you are using a hash map and just referencing it by the key. So that makes signals really fast. This concept goes beyond the virtual DOM. Let me also show you, I obviously made one more version of the catalog. This time it was built with the signals. So it's the same selected box ID and selected value and this time the values are like wrapped under signals. And these signals are right now available and it was made by Preact. So they have this very interesting blog post explaining how signals are like really great and there is like one nice screenshot that I can show you. Mm, let me go to their blog. Yeah. So this is the comparison of the JavaScript thread with the virtual DOM and with the signals in a really large application. Right now, Preact supports signals really well. And React also has a signals package. So this is the React version of this signals package. So I just took it and recreated the whole application. This time, what, I do, what I'm doing here is I am passing the signal value. So you can see in the TypeScript inference, it's not a number, it's a signal object and I will pass the object to my DOM element instead of passing it as a plain number. And everything else is simple, it's exactly the same. I have like an input field where I am like setting the box value and on change I am updating the value. No difference over here. But the beauty of signals shows up when I am doing the same ex experiment. Now let me select a different box. Let me select like 18. Now, if I do any update, you will notice that there is like no jitter anywhere because like there is absolutely no reason for the React component to re-render. I am doing a fine grain update on that exact DOM node where the number is present. So if you are like learning about doing an optimization and you want like a quick win, you can always obviously like turn your states into signals and start optimizing it, but it comes with its own limitations. Because signals are good at only changing the DOM values, which means if you are doing any kind of computations, then there is another primitive called computed. You will have to take that one and create computed signals that uh, I think you can learn from the documentation. It comes with experience, but there are certain caveats also you have to like know. 
and the fastest way to learn signals is I'll tell everyone to go and build a new project out of SolidJS and you will know how good signals are and you will actually hesitate to start using states again in React. Now let's get back on track. So the thing is now we have, we are gonna like uh, simulate a really large application. Okay, that is like actually slow and like struggles to re-render and we are gonna look at how the actual virtual DOM works on in that scenario. So what I did is I took this example from one of the open source projects. So this is the component. So what I'm going to do is I have a display component here. So it's going to display a multiplication table, a normal multiplication value. And what it will do is it will along with the number render like 100 DOM elements that are like practically empty. So it renders 100 such DOM element. And what I'm going to further do is that is for one item, I'm gonna repeat that process 2000 times. That is like 2000 into 100. So I'm gonna like render a drastically like huge DOM element with zero optimizations. I'm just gonna go with virtual DOM. And let's see how the whole application like per performs. And you will also notice uh, a lag radar added on the page. So that radar basically like uh, shows active activity on the JavaScript thread. So that uh, spinning radar that you are seeing. So every time it's having that yellow or like red color pattern, which means DOM update is happening and the application is actually lagging. Which means any interactivity on the page will actually like causes the application to slow down. Okay, it has finished rendering all the items. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start a timer and have React update all the DOM nodes. Now if you look at my code, I'm like being very explicitly clear, saying that I only need this item, this DOM element to be like changed and these are like not exactly like DOM nodes that needs to be changed. But what will happen is React will still try to like compare them internally through the virtual DOM. So what happens is as I am starting a timer and the count uh, starts, you will see for every render how long it is taking. So for every render it's like taking 0 0.9 seconds and the average is around 0 0.8. And for every render you will see that red color flicker saying that okay, it's actually taking a while for it to like uh, do this render. So how do we like optimize this, this situation? So ideally the easiest way to optimize this scenario is make sure you are reducing the number of DOM elements in your application because by being smart you can like actually bring the amount of DOM elements to a considerable extent. Because internally React has to like construct this 2000 into 100 DOM nodes on a virtual DOM and has to like manually do a reference check across every single one of them which basically like makes the entire application like slow. Right now it averaged around like 0 0.78. So I, I was like thinking about it, uh, thinking about it for a while, like how we can bring it down, what was the community working around it. And there have been like very interesting projects. So one interesting project was a different virtual uh, DOM algorithm. It's called a block DOM. So how this algorithm works is it converts each DOM element into an independent block and make sure it only compares reference equality of that specific block that has been changed thereby bringing down the amount of comparison by a lot. So it has like a tutorial on how to make your own framework. So I was like following this tutorial along. So it teaches you how to build your own React like framework. So he builds a framework called Tomato and has the same state render and all of this. So I was like trying this, but unfortunately like ran out of time. I had to like prepare the example, but there was another interesting project called Million. So Million.js is a, alternate virtual uh, DOM library. So right now this is, I think, being sponsored by Vercel. And this actually took inspiration from Block DOM. And right now it is like available to use. So what Million.js does is that it lets you convert your um, React components into blocks directly on the code. So now, let me uh, go to that Block DOM implementation. So, Million.js basically like uh, 
introduces this uh, wrapper called block. And using the block, what I can do is I can wrap a component inside that block. So the component that was displaying my value, right, is actually like uh, displayed as a block. And here you might think why I'm like printing the values instead of doing the computation directly on the component. Because technically I can do I, I into count, it will print the value. But I wasn't able to do that because once I convert everything to a block using million, what will happen is everything will become an object. They are no longer like proper numbers that I can multiply. And by making everything into an object, million can actually like reduce the number of comparisons it has to do to update your DOM. So I went back and built the same application this time using million. So no difference, I just wrapped the entire display using a block DOM. And it takes a while for it to render. There is like so many DOM nodes it has to render. And it takes a while. Okay, cool. Now, if I start the timer, what I can see is, let's hope it is like actually performing better this time. <laughs> cool. It's like alternating between worse and better. So previously it was like consistently at 0 0.9. Now you will see that this is like alternating across 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. So it does its best to like make sure it is optimizing the number of re-renders across. So as the timer runs, you will know the average, how it is like uh, optimizing it to a certain extent. Now, once again, this is a concept that you won't like have to implement every day in your work. Because this happens only when your DOM like grows into like a different magnitude. But it's always a good thing to know how the virtual DOM works, how we can like leverage different concepts like signals, just and, and even like different rendering modules, which will make sure you can like actually do better as you are like scale, reaching that specific scale. Okay, so that pretty much like uh, concludes the talk. And this is pretty much all the tools that are like used in the talk. I'll make sure I share this directly on the React me Meetup uh, page. And in case anybody wants to like connect with me on Twitter, you can like uh, follow me on this handle. I'll be more than happy to like answer your questions. Cool. Um, okay, let's move on to the questions part. Uh, Anybody having like any questions so far on the talk? Uh, signals doesn't use even bus. So the way signals work is it has a setter. The setter is basically a function. So it's like accessing a property through a function. And that function, when it's initialized, it adds a listener saying, hey, I am in this DOM element, so make sure you are like updating this specific DOM when the value is changing. So previously what happens in regular re-renders is you only send the value, which means you don't know where that value is. So you cannot like directly update the DOM, but this time since you are sending an object, you can actually like fine grain the renders to only the specific DOM nodes that needs updates. you can pass signals as a prop. Here I just passed it as a prop. So if you can check my code also. Simple box is a component. I just passed the value as a prop to to that component. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't really follow what the block wrapper was doing in the million JS implementation. It, it's simple. It just it takes a normal React component and converts it into a different DOM, uh, virtual DOM compatible component, that's it. That virtual uh, DOM algorithm is little more efficient than the usual virtual DOM. Okay, so it's just a different implementation basically of... Uh, yeah, okay. and the good thing about Million is you don't have to rewrite the entire application, you can convert specific parts into the better DOM implementation. Uh, hi, so I just wanted to ask, uh, have you tried digging in like why it is uh, that much optimized, so I 
uh, I believe it is uh, trying to create some kind of lookup table where it has some kind of key value structure for that where we wrap the component into block and then tries to re-enter. So my real question is, uh, to do that, it has to find that uh, particular DOM and then uh, play with it. So uh, the competition is happening previously rather than happening on the runtime, I believe. I also like don't know the implementation in that much detail. So I'm still learning from the block DOM implementation itself. But Million has published a paper on like how their rendering method is like really good. You might want to like uh, give that a read. I'm also planning to like learn in the coming weeks. Uh, th that is because I am like rendering so many DOM elements. So here itself, if you look at, at some point, when I was running benchmarks locally in my machine, uh, in a different laptop and all, I used to get like 60, 70% better. It used to like do the updates in 0 0.3 seconds rather than 0 0.8. Yeah. Yeah. Th that that is correct like that's uh, why i also showed zustan and uh, signals approach earlier so the thing is it's about you know how the virtual dom works you have to like figure out what is the right approach to take care of that there might be a situation where you will have so many dom elements and you need to like make a change right rewriting the entire application in signals will be like a pretty big in that scenario what you can do is you can take all the props out and convert the final components into a block component using million. That would save a lot of time. And even in millions benchmarks, actually they are like uh, targeting a speed that is like better than solid and it's signal implementation. So million is like a pretty good things to, uh, I recommend everyone to try. Cool. Any more question, guys? Yeah, yeah. They are also like live. Kiran has posted them in Meetup group. So, cool. Thank you, guys. Thanks for taking the time on weekend for coming to this talk. <laughs> and once again, thanks to the React Bangalore community for giving me this chance. Hello everyone, I'm Angurag. I'm an engineer and a technical writer, currently working at Locofy. Uh, I, am a, I like to experiment a lot with different frameworks, libraries, and unlike the previous talk that we had, which was much more uh, in-depth with a lot of uh, how to scale, this is going to be a more beginner-friendly guide on how you can build full-stack applications really quickly. So today I will be presenting to you uh, ask JS and in this talk we will see uh, how we can set up an Ascrow project and all the different elements in it that make it uh, a great framework for full stack development. So the first question in your mind must be what is Ascrow JS and why you should even like there are so many frameworks like in developer world we think uh, in every single week or in every single hour there is a new framework released. So what makes Ascrow so different? 
So guys, the number one thing that makes Ascro very different is that there is uh, zero KB of JavaScript overhead, and it does so using something called gang island architecture. We will see all of this in detail in just a few minutes. But besides this, uh, Ascro also has some unique key highlights. So for example, you can use different UI frameworks as well with Ascro. So you can use Svelte, Preact, or you can even use SolidJS. So if you are familiar with Signals, um, you can use something like SolidJS or Koga Box. And besides this, this is just a Skanger MPA framework, multi-page framework uh, like NickJS. Okay, I'm just having some issues over here. Yep. So let us see the zero KB of JavaScript in action. Yep. So even though we say we are JavaScript developers, we like to we like to write JavaScript. At the end of the day, I would not want to ship unnecessary JavaScript to my end users. So over here, you can see uh, in terms of this page that we have over here. Uh, just a second. Yep. So on the page over here, you can see that our JavaScript is actually zero bytes that have been shipped to the end user. And in this page, we are getting all the responsive functionalities as well, thanks to Kelvin CSS. And this was actually built with Ascro. Uh, when we compare this something to a React application, a uh, similar scale, uh, discuss. Yep. over here, so this is a build uh, production ready React application. And if I'm reloading the page over here, you can see I've not added any functionality, any use effect, any use cake. Yet there is one for key KB of um, JavaScript that is being shipped. So how do we avoid all of this unnecessary JavaScript overhead? So what Ascro does here is it introduces something like an island architecture. And island architecture in brief basically means that your entire web page will be HTML. So you will only see HTML everywhere. Uh, and you will have these small islands of interactivity that will be powered by JavaScript. So to add this elements of interactivity, what you can do is you can add this uh, client log over here as online forking. And what it means is that everything besides this logging form uh, will actually be uh, powered by just HTML and CSS. Whereas online forking, the logging form will also have the JavaScript attached. So this is how uh, Ascro actually handles um, zero KBJS and the island architecture. Now before we move on to how we can uh, handle stake management and how we can run server side code, let us just see how Ascro is different from NickJS. So Ascro and NickJS do have some similarities in the sense that they both are MPA frameworks. However, they do also have their own differences. So the number one difference between them is, is of course the support for different UI libraries. So Ascro, you can use well React, uh, Preact view, but NextJS is uh, React exclusive. And the other difference between them, the major one is the adapter system. So NextJS, if you deploy to anywhere else, if you go to an AWS and you try to deploy it, you will know that uh, the issues that you will face over there. Because deploying NextJS on Lambda Edge is a pain. And with Ascro, what you get is you get these different adapters that you can use to uh, easily configure your app to run on Cloudflare, uh, AWS, or any other provider of your choice. So these are the major differences that you can see. Um, now let's see the uh, basic app in Ascro and how we can actually install React and Kailwing in it. So I have created this uh, template over here, which is the Ascro Scarker template. So by default, if you run the basic command on their Ascro, which is npm create Ascro at the latest, you will get this basic uh, empty template over here. And what I would be doing is I would be actually installing React and Kailwing CSS and Coic. So in Ascal, you can, again, I'm mentioning that you can use different frameworks and it's very easy to install all of these UI frameworks in Kugam. So all you can do to install React and Kailwing is run npx 
as Ruag, React, and then I also want Scalewing CSS so we can add Scalewing. Just click continue and this will automatically configure a file here called Asplu config and add everything over there. So this was it and now we can create a Scangler say components folder and let's create a sample react component. Let me also add some styles over here. So I'll just add a guess. And now we can um, import it anywhere. So this is a standard ASCRO page and I'll be importing a React component over here. Now let me restart the project. Uh, get some um, issue, okay, this should be components. Yep. Now you can see that we got a hello and this hello is actually rendered by the React component and it already has the Kailwing styles applied to it as well. So this is how you can install uh, React and Kailwing into your Astro apps and move faster as well. So now let's look at a more real world example. So one of the things you might be noticing in an app while well, building is the scale management. So the scale management was also discussed by the previous Cocker Akash uh, over here. But Ascro is uh, Ascro also recommends a scale management solution, and the scale management that it offers is actually framework agnostic. So uh, if you have a Swell component and a React component, you can easily share these cakes between them as well. And the way it does GAC is by using something called uh, nano scores which you can see over here. But before we jump into code, let me just show you the example that I have created. So this is a page over here, which is a scanner page and this is where React excels because there are so many different components and you can easily split your app into different components. Now you will notice that when I'm hitting the button over here, add to cart, you can see the checkout button at the at over here is actually updating. So if I'm again clicking it, you can see it, it keeps updating every time I, I'm hitting the button. So this is actually done by something called nano scores that we have. And if I go to my index page, you can see that all of these are different buttons, uh, different UI components. Uh, in my Astro app. However, there is no uh, single pairing or a uh, React context that I'm using. Because if I use React context, I can only share scape between my React components. But I also want to share the scape between different components uh, like Swell view. So for this, I'm using something called uh, Nano Scores. And I'm creating a file over here, uh, which is a, basically a JavaScript or a TypeScript file. And I'm using something called Atoms, which is very similar to a provider that we have in use context. I'm passing a value as zero. So you can only pass in single value or a, you can also pass in a JavaScript object, but you cannot pass in like a array and it's not very optimized for objects. So if you are using object, you can use something called map, but we won't be seeing that today. So what I've done here is again, you have used the island architecture and I have made everything on the for example, this particular buttons and everything image, everything it does not have JavaScript. Only the header buttons and the buttons over here, they have JavaScript. And let me open up the file. Yep. So the buttons over here is actually this act to cart button. And I'm using something called use score, which is again provided by the nano score scheme. And what I'm doing here is I'm actually simply, this is very simple uh, JavaScript and TypeScript that work. So the cart number that I just created over here, like right? this one, I can actually import it over here and I can, it gives us a lot of function. So it gives us sec, get, listen, notify and all of these different functions. And all I'm doing here is I'm just using sec and I'm incrementing the value by one on that to cart. So this is how uh, when I'm clicking on add to cart, the value is getting incremented. And for my checkout button, um, 
for my checkout button again I'm using u score but over here I'm not updating a value all I'm doing is I'm just simply uh, placing the value over here and this actually places the value up over here and again it updates like, as you can see so this is how you can actually handle stake management across different UI components now let's move on to a much more uh, full stack application like a server side coding it and for this I will be using a uh, dashboard as an application so this is the app that I already showed to you guys before and we will see how we will actually build this application so this is the Figma designs that I have created in advance for the dashboard and usually what I would do is I would actually code this by hand and convert all of these components uh, to a pixel perfect code by hand but to respect your time and mine I will simply use a plugin, loco5 plugin uh, yep. and our design is actually using auto layout out of the box so uh, it is responsive on Figma and the loco5 plugin actually builds up on the Figma plugins as well uh, the Figma settings so if it is responsive on Figma it is responsive on loco5 as well however one thing that you should keep in mind is for example there is a button like we all know this is a button uh, if we, if I ask any bugging audience, they will tell you yeah, this sign up is a button. But for our Figma, actually, this is just a rectangle with some border radius. So, in my plugin, in my Figma uh, Loco5 plugin, I will just use this element and I will uh, attach a HTML cat quick called button over here. And just select a UI library none. And then, to make this responsive, I can also add styles quick based on the different breakpoints that we have so for example if the um, breakpoint is 600 pixels I can go and uh, add some hover effects and increase uh, so the width so you, after adding all of the CSS properties and uh, add responsive properties uh, you can see the design in action on the preview screen uh, let me open up this one as well so you can see this is responsive on loco5 and this, this is actually running on live code as well so once you are uh, happy with this we can just click done and then let me just view the code over here again we will see uh, how loco5 generates the responsive code and we will import it into astro and i will discuss how you can import your existing projects existing react projects into astro so this is the code loco5 has generated and you can actually create uh, components as well because of course uh, a real in real world you would not be making this entire dashboard in a single react file like you would split it into different components so for example if i want to select say uh, a section over here say a say a welcome to dashboard section and i want to split it into a component i can just click component over here and click create component and when the code is exported you will see that this particular uh, element is, has, is having its own component and uh, its own file so once you are happy with it again just click on export code and ignore the recommendations for now and just click on confirm export so the code that we generated already uses uh, react uh, kelvin out of the box i already have the code open over here uh, it's in a folder called react fronting and this is the code that we have so all the components that we generated are placed in the components folder and in the pages we have the pages uh, like a normal react component as well and this component actually imports the other uh, react components and then shows them so how do we move this into an astro app so the first thing that we need to do is uh, we have a global CSS file over here on our React front end. Now we need to move this file into our Astro so that all our settings and all our uh, import of fonts are correctly applied. So on our Astro side what we can do is uh, I've already went ahead and created this configuration for you guys. So on Astro config you can even pass in some custom objects into our integrations. So what are Kelvin, uh, Kelvin integration, I have passed a config object and I have 
segi apply base styles ko false what it means is now i have to create my own uh, i have to create my own base css file so over here we are pasting the css file from our local file generic uh, file that we have uh, for the global styles so once you have this file now it is a piece of cake to move your existing react components to uh, ascro so the number one thing you should do is just copy the components folders as it is to your ascro project as we have done over here once you have moved all the components you can even copy the page over here as it is just copy everything and move it to your pages over here like i have done so this is everything however one thing to remember is uh, react uses class name but ascro actually uses class so you have to rename the class name uh, to class over here and that's it when you go it uh, just make sure the component imports are right so there might be some uh, might be some differences like we just saw in the previous example so just make sure you have using the right folder name and that should be it and now you should see this in action over here now now that we know how easy it is to move our uh, create react apps to ascro let's see how ascro handles server side code so you will notice uh, over here is that uh, before pasting all of this code that we generated in a react app right we have this particular block of code at the top as well at the starting portion so this is actually uh, an ascro is opening a way of how you should write server side code so anything that you write between this um, three things is, is actually running on the server. So what I've done here is I am basically creating a super base client and I'm checking if the user is authenticated or not. So for authentication, I'm using the Ascro's cookie uh, method and Ascro, you can think of it as a similar uh, alternative to Next.js context that we have in the get server side props. So basically, I'm accessing the server's refresh and access keys, and then I'm checking in with Superbase if the user, if a session exists for that user. If the session exists and there are not any errors, then basically what I'm doing is I'm just uh, I'm using Prisma as my ORM to fetch some things from my database. However, if the user is not authenticated on the server side itself, I can redirect them to a separate page or I can display uh, another UI for them. Now, one interesting thing to note over here is the server side rendering as well. So, the values that I'm passing over here is, and guys, entire page is actually rendered on the server. And again, this is the client side architecture. So, if you need JavaScript for any specific pages or if you have some client side code, you can just add client log over here and this would actually um, log this uh, basically enable javascript interactivities for this client and to demonstrate that every uh, every react component that you are seeing can actually leverage all the react libraries that are out there uh, i have created this login form over here and in the login form i'm using the standard react libraries that you would use so i'm using use effect I'm using a scanner going click listener, I'm clicking a super base client and I'm even using something called the react cookie package to set some cookies that my uh, server can later on uh, digest and check for authentication. So this is how you can actually run server side code on Astro and however there is one another thing uh, that makes a function that makes a framework full stack is the support for uh, is there is is um is actually a connection between your front end and back end that a full stack framework should have. So this there are different frameworks with different approaches. So Remix has this um, use actions and a logger kind of a, a connectivity. In Next.js you can use KRPC and React query for these kind of to uh, connect to your back end. So in Astro as well you can use all of these libraries like React query and uh, KRPC. But uh, the standard approach or the more uh, beginner approaches could just create an API endpoint and from your client you can hit that API endpoint on your backend and basically pass the Gekka and then use the frontend to guide this Gekka. So you can do something similar over here as well. 
Uh, okay, let me just restart the project once. Yep. So you can do something similar on Ascro as well. So in Ascro, just like make this, you can create a API folder, and in that API folder, you can create a file. So I've created a hello file that you are seeing. Uh, however, Ascro actually makes the developer experience a bit better in this sense, uh, because you can you you should notice the naming conventions that we have over here. So each function's name, like get, post, and patch, all of these are actually HTTP methods. So you don't need to write all of those if else statements. So you don't need to write if method is post, then run this particular function. Um, this makes like a very clean imp uh, implementation of uh, APIs. Now we can even see this in action. So for example, if I'm uh, hitting a post over here using postman, uh, let me hit post. You can see we got method post with a hello as a message. So this is from this particular function. Similarly, if I'm going for get, so let me just change the method, and you can see we are getting this uh, information that we have. And we also have a catch-all API method called all. And for example, if I'm using, say something like copy, you can see we got method copy, which is basically this uh, equity concept over here. And these are all standard uh, methods, Node.js methods that you can run on your side. So you can call Prisma, you can uh, implement all of these complex functionalities. However, the thing over here is to keep in mind is, if you are deploying a to edge runtime, then you, you should make sure that whatever you're running over here is actually compatible with the edge runtime. So this actually brings us to the final slide that we have, which is the adapters, which I again I talked about earlier as well. So once you are ready with your Astro app, you can deploy it anywhere. So they, ha they have their own host of SSR adapters that you can see. So they have Cloudflare, Netlify, Astro, Vercel, and the Edge runtime that I mentioned earlier. So if you click over here in Vercel, so if you notice, Vercel actually offers you three different kinds of deployment, which is um, Edge and serverless and Skakic deployment. Skakic has got ASIC, like uh, SSD deployments. So you can choose any three of these deployments with Ascro. And if you are choosing Edge over here, like if you're importing from the Edge package, just make sure that whatever API you are writing, it is actually compatible to run on the Edge runtime. So this actually concludes uh, everything there is as that Ascro has to offer for full stack functionality. Besides this, Ascro, uh, you can has an excellent support for Markdown as well. But uh, GAC will actually deviate us from discussing the full stack functionalities because Markdown is more for content oriented websites. So that's it. And if anybody has any questions, uh, I would be happy to take it for the video. If nobody is asking a question, I'll take it as a good sign gag. I explained everything clearly. <laughs> it's only supported Tailwind CSS only? Uh, yeah, at the moment, uh, for in terms of CSS customization, Tailwind CSS has an out of the box support. Yeah. But you can use uh, UI libraries as well, like okay. Chakra UI and uh, Material UI library as well. Okay. It has support for all the standard React libraries, so you can even import Mankind or any other, like, Bing CSS as well, if you want. Okay. So, the components. Sorry? So, the Locofy plugin generates, like, Mankind components. Uh, Locofy actually supports uh, three or four different UI libraries. It supports Chakra UI, Bookscrap, Material, and uh, I can Kelvin CSS as well, yeah. So it has support for all of these UI libraries and what in Locofy side, what you can do is uh, once you have generated these components like with lo you have to use auto layout and then what you can do with Locofy is you can tag these elements because we don't know like so for example like this is a button to us but um, for a Figma design this is just a rectangle and this is just a, like a circular thing. 
So with Locofy you can attach HTML tags to all of these buttons and then what you can do is you can click on Egg over here and you can even add some custom like breakpoints. So for example on say example for this button you want that on breakpoints less than 600 pixels you want it to be again. So you can click on this and you can add some custom properties to it. Yeah, actually, so, you can see the code that I've generated, and, yep, yeah, actually, the thing over here is, it actually boils down to how efficiently your Figma design is uh, respons responsive. So, if you, uh, these are actually values that I've used inside my Figma designs, uh, some place, like I've man manually adjusted, it could be like 73%, so this is, it creates a one-on-one -on -one copy from Figma. Yep. Yeah, actually we can see how it looks on resizing as well. So this is the page and this is the sidebar that you were talking about. Yep. So let me go to this one. Make this uh, pretty large over here. Yep. And now if we go back you can see that it kind of feels really natural itself. Yep. The code quality actually depends on how well you optimize your Figma files, to be honest. So if you use something like Oco layouts on your Figma file, and if it is responsive on Figma itself, then the code that local file will generate will be pixel perfect, and it will look like for a end user they won't notice. Like if, if it was written by a uh, developer by hand or was it generated by AI. Locofy actually uses AI in the background to convert all of these designs. No, this is uh, this is in Bika stage right now, and it is it is free. Yep. Yep, it only supports components right now. So it does not support subcomponents. Uh, you can also add by the way value props. So the things, uh, if you want, you can even extend the code like. So what you can do is you can, for example, like over here we have food panda, and. This is, for example, like you want to fetch some things, a list from your database and you want to render it out. So what you can go in the Locofy Builder is, you can select this component over here that we have, this entire thing. And then you can uh, click on make component, let's name it something like a company. And then you can pass in the props quick. So for example, like a food panda is a name, I can pass in like company name. And now for the rest of these items, uh, you can simply select them and you can attach the same component to them, like this company. Yeah, reuse this. Case. And now you can also see the code quality by the way. So if you go over here, you can see uh, this is the file that we have. This is the company file. We just created this component and it already has these designs, all of the values. And these are already like placed in the right file. You can see this beforehand. Yeah, so it makes the designer to developer hang off very smooth. Yeah. So, anybody has any other questions? Okay, I can. I would be wrapping up this session. Um, it was a great opportunity to be up here and present to you guys. How many here are developers? That's what I expected. Right. How many here want to be CTOs going forward at a later point in the career? Let's say for Jaguar, Land Rover or company like that, which is pretty famous. Nobody wants to be a CTO. Right. That's interesting.
Right. Uh, so, uh, I want this session to be quite interactive. So, my name is Shiban Banerjee. I have 15 years of exp CTO experience in companies such as uh, Marks & Spencer's, Jaguar, Land Rover, currently uh, Cambridge University, uh, spend a lot of time in UK. Currently, I'm the CTO of a company called Drink Prime. Right. Now, uh, this would be pretty much a non-tech session from at least the looks of it, right? But, uh, as long as I can turn the slides off on, right. But, why is this important to you? I've used turn the phrase turning ideas into products, right? If I can take the example of the tech ladder, how you progress from a developer to whatever your aspirations are, right? At the beginning, uh, we are, so I started as a developer as well. So we are developers, right? We are worried about a requirement, right? Um, a screen, a page, something, something, five classes, properties, functions, and all of that. Then we become tech leads, wherein we are worried about requirements, something we are doing ourselves, but also the job of what others are doing. So we are responsible for others' work. Great. Till now, it's actually, so it's technical requirements, right? Great. Then, since, uh, this is where things start becoming funny, right? Now people will come to you with business requirements. So you have a lot of tech leads and developers, but people will come to you with business requirements. So they no, no longer need just a feature. What they need is, I want, I'm an ops leader. My technician goes out into the field. My, I want my customer to, to get a notification saying he is out for delivery. And I want my customer to be able to call that technician but I don't want that technician's number to be available. So it has to be masked in some way. Great. So now you've got to translate that into technical requirements. You along with others would be developing that. Great. Now that's solution architect. Now in any, any large company, there is also a concept called enterprise architect. So as a solution architect, you are typically solution architects would be specific to a particular business area. So a customer experience solution architect, operations, etc., inventory and assets, for in instance. Enterprise architect is when things start becoming insane. People really, literally expect you to know everything. So as an enterprise architect, in any damn big company whatsoever, people expect you to be an expert in every business area, an expert in every technology, right? So somebody wanted to uh, explore how, what would be sort of the driverless car back end and this and that, etc., etc. in another conference. So I was in a Microsoft conference giving a session uh, earlier and this guy comes to me, he's a CTO of, a CEO of something, something, something. He wants to discuss that with me and he doesn't expect me to say no. So as an enterprise architect, you are expected to know everything. Of course, that's not possible. How you manage it is the trick. Right? The idea behind me starting with this is that so you understand the bigger picture. Once you understand the picture, you know where you fit and you can then decide where to go. Right? And all this ladder structure, this doesn't, this has no relation to salary. I just, uh, please. Right? A great developer. So there is somebody in my team. Uh, she is four years of experience, 11 years uh, younger than me. She's an awesome developer, better than what I ever was, right? So salary has nothing to do with this. This whole graph assumes that the skill level is, is the same, right? So don't confuse it with that. Um, I'm sure we all want to earn this. Next, at this stage, you are given a choice. You can become sort of uh, engineering manager or head of engineering as our first speaker was and he uh, and these people are damn technical so they would know everything from there to here right uh, the whole shebang then but they would uh, but you also have an option to go into the product side of course product has an, has its own path so a product manager need not be a developer and all of that but at this stage you have the worst headache almost the worst headache of all nobody wants to do this which is manage all this Right? Timelines and stuff like that, nobody likes it, right? But this is a choice, right? Now, then comes the big jump, right? Till now, the what was business technical requirements earlier is now business requirements here. And then it was problems, right? So now, for example, here, 
uh, as the head of engineering, you would be coming. People will be coming to you with problems. What does what does that mean? So they no they no, no longer have a business requirement. What they want is my customer is dissatisfied because they are not uh, because they don't know when our guy is coming to their places. So solve this. That then leads to the notification to the customer for out to delivery. Blah 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 blah. So now you have a business problem. Now at the end of the tech ladder when you are an exec when you are literally part of the management or the owner ownership of the company there's something weird the reason of one of one of the many reasons one of the fundamental reasons why i wanted to give this talk here uh, considering this crowd is that this is something that we never are exposed to as developers as developers no ceo would be coming to us and say that i want to be the king of the world give me a product right i have had the uh, ceo of uh, the one of the largest luxury car manufacturers in the world come and tell me something like i want every customer complaint to be a wow moment for the customer right uh, uh, i'm struggling not to use profanity but my literal reaction was wtf what are you talking about right as developers imagine somebody comes to you with this requirement uh i'll give it this example again shortly after uh, in a couple of slides later the ceo of one of the largest retail uh, stores in uk came and told me something like i want to beat amazon on my own turf what does that mean what will you build right now as developers you are never exposed to this in any other department you are always exposed more and more you uh, are exp become experienced you are exposed to the strategic stuff and all that but tech is one such one of those weird things where you are never exposed to those kind of things right so my talk is about how you go about that given that you will never have exposure to this but when you are at this sort of the last two levels people would expect you to do this right and they don't care whether you have have or have not done that before right so this is just a small sample fair enough Ah, and this is something you always know. It starts with being accountable for tasks, but slowly it becomes accountable for outcomes and people as well, which is a very different ball game. But right, so how do you turn ideas into products? I'm going to give a couple of examples for big companies, and then I'm going to explain how is this different for startups, right? So both. I'm sure. How many uh, here ha uh, have an aspiration to launch their own startup or at least co-found one? Awesome. quite a lot how many want to remain in their existing job that's one <laughs> two <laughs> at least the loco five people should say yes <laughs> right so uh, so how do you turn ideas into products first and foremost ideas can never be products counterintuitive as they sound i want to go, i want to be the top of sort of the king of the world can never be a product find the problem so while for example um elon musk wants us to go to mars right and that sounds like a fascinating product to all of us techies right uh, for to most at least i'm uh, i'm i i saw the wins uh brilliant but it's technically it's an awesome thing right going to mars the thing is those ideas would never be neither be tangible products nor would be sellable products people won't go to mars unless they have a problem which is fixed by when they go to mars right so find the problem don't get blown on blown away with the idea itself find the problem that you want to solve and drill it down into as much detail as possible we want to help teachers and we want to help education our education state of education in india is not good brilliant what do you exactly want to do right drill down into as much uh, detail as possible who when what remember that i'll give examples of who when what what i mean by that now and then how will you solve that problem for someone uh, let me give you an example right and this is a section i uh, call i want to be king of the world because this is literally what sort of visionaries ceos founders sound like most of the time right uh, i've seen a fair share of them i'm sure many of you have as well right when the ceo calls you to the room and then this i want to do this i want to do that and this and that right so one of the biggest luxury car manufacturers in the world the example which i was giving earlier this is uh, uh, this, this was the chief operating officer and this was the statement in a meeting room and i was like what 
um, what exactly right now so who when and what so the whole premise was that this is one of the biggest and the most well known car manufacturers in the world that to that to luxury cars now a customer complain right so if you buy any product if there is a problem what would you do you will call it contact customer support right or raise a ticket or something like that if you buy a ferrari for example you don't expect to be calling customer support right it's not supposed to go wrong anywhere same with these guys right so it's just supposed to work so the fact that you are having to complain itself is by itself a problem it's not good right but then who is the person that we are talking about here so it's the, it is the, is it the average customer but if that person is in a crowded neighborhood or uh, in the at their own home at their own homes they have a backup right so they are, if i am at my home if i have to get somebody to repair my car that's great i don't have this not that big of a problem when would somebody would be actually pissed so uh, uk uh, has plenty of areas where you have sort of people you're driving in places where there is nobody in a 5 mile radius right that's when if my car breaks down i'm i'm incredibly frustrated why because a the car broke down and second there is nobody in a 5 mile radius so i know for a fact that the, any help would be at least 2 hours later right so who has the problem now r- rather than saying customer so we have drilled that down to a customer who is on a holiday driving somewhere in the middle of mountains uh, where there is nobody in a 5 mile radius for instance right so now that's a more solvable problem right global warming cannot be solved right you can solve one step one thing at a time right same thing so that's my customer when when they are driving right in when they are in that kind of a situation and what are they exactly doing so their car broke down so first they would want their what do they want they want their car to not break down first but then if it break down breaks down they want to be very easily able to call somebody up and they want that person to be there then and there right as 5 10 minutes right but it's the middle of nowhere we actually did do exactly that right and that's a wow moment so how did we how did we get to that point right so what we figured out is that how will it be a wow moment so when when my car when your car has broken down you know that uh, i okay uh, sort of profanity aside i won't use the terms but then you know that there would be sort of 2 uh, 3 hours you would have to wait uh, without actually doing anything now what would be awesome at that point because you are already pessimistic by that point what would be awesome if you call somebody and then they arrive there 5 minutes later right it's as if it were a genie because it's simply not possible there was nobody around so how did we go about that so that is what the use case that sort of that would be the product how can we first do preventive maintenance so the car is jacked up with iot each car i'm talking about gives about 1 to 5 gb of iot data per hour because it's uk middle of mountains a lot of places wouldn't won't have any network at all so any maintenance preventive maintenance would have to be self corrective so there was a lot of edge computing there and based on the iot signals a lot of self correction used to be happening on the cars that's one part solved but you can't solve everything with self correcting mechanisms however however fan- fancy that sounds so we had plenty of iot signals so when any component let's say and i'm not fully conscious that i'm a, I'm a full uh, room full of react developers not that component but uh, any component when they go below th- the 30% efficiency mark they would give out an alert right we would have service centers all across uh, the uk and they would get the notification and then they know where to come right wrong because that's only 30 so that component let's say the engine for the sake of simplicity is at the 30% mark by the time that broke break actually breaks down he would have been 20 200 kilometers or miles somewhere east west north south right so and this was the eureka moment 
So we figured out that based on the pa travel pattern in the last few days and for that particular trip, what if we could predict, so we got at the 30% mark, so it went down, at the 30% mark, we know that there might be a problem. What if we can predict where he might be in the, in the by the time it goes to 5%? We'll take the top three spots and the alert which go down, goes out to the service centers would have those predicted locations and not the original location. And yes, it's, uh, it's a sort of loss that we, uh, we would get people to be at all those three locations, but fine. Uh, in the, uh, because a luxury car, luxury experience, it's worth it, right? So what would happen is that by the time somebody would pick uh, uh, sort of on the app, it was augmented reality and all of that, all fancy stuff. But the moment they called, within five minutes, somebody's there. And they're like, wow, how did you get there so fast? And they forget at that time that there was actually sort of a problem to start with, right? Uh, so we boiled it down from there to here, right? So uh, it, obviously it involved plenty of systems, augmented reality, plenty of front end, loads of APIs, third party systems, et cetera, et cetera. And of course AI, because I talk of, talked of prediction and anything to do with prediction, people prefer these days to put it as AI. Although people, we were predicting stuff 20 years ago, but at the moment, everything is AI. Right. One other example, and I'll just uh, sort of skip through it. The head of the largest retail store company in the UK, he started with, I want to beat Amazon at my own turf. We actually boiled it down to, right, so what if, so what you want is that people, when they come, so the kind of people who don't mind the inconvenience of going to a store, like online shopping is convenient, you don't have to get up. So for the non-lazy people of the world, when they come to your store, they should be in and out in three minutes. Meaning that if we can predict what items are popular at which sort of times of the day, then we can keep those at the front, meaning that if you want, if you know what you want, then you should be able to get in and out in three minutes. Great. The other part of experience is also sort of the human uh, part of it. The f fact that if the, you have a problem, if you have spilled a bottle of milk or something, uh, spilled a black bag of chips, somebody's immediately there to help you instead of getting embarrassed. So what we did was uh, so using security cameras, uh, we analyzed detected motion, figured out things like congestion and stuff like that. They were sent uh, on an app which we built to, for the staff who were strategically positioned. They knew if there is a congestion in that aisle, anybody, one of the, these people would be there in five seconds, right? Things like that. So the point which I'm trying to make, so it involved a lot of stuff, but what I, the point which I'm trying to make is that it actually started with this. And this is a discussion which uh, un, until you reach a certain stage, people won't be having with you. Uh, and I'm not talking about sort of people who want to launch their own startup. You can call yourself CEOs, kings, whatever. That's not the experience which I'm talking about. In, in that case, you will actually be starting from something like this, right? You will have a vision and mission. So it's important to boil that down. Uh, otherwise, you will never land up in a product, at least a product with work, which sort of works for customers. Right, so uh, just a series of examples, but that sort of uh, retail example which I gave, it included Azure, it, uh, loads of AI, IoT, edge computing, loads of APIs. We actually wrote sort of, there were six systems which were built, 57 APIs, loads of other stuff, and all of that was done by a team of us, 20 people in a space of eight months, right? But before all of that came the part of boiling that thing down, right? Now, how is it different for a startup? Anybody, any guesses? Who were the sort of 50 people who raised their hands that they want to launch a, launch a startup? You were not, you were one of the two people who said, I want to be, uh, I'm yeah, being the same kind of, which company do you work for? What? Free? <laughs> Figures. And you, yourself? Okay, right. Huh. So that's, uh, that's more legitimate. Right. <laughs> Right, anybody, how is it different from a startup? For a, for a, for a startup, yes. For a startup, they are more, they are more customer right now. They are solving the problem, they are going to the market, they have not like, uh, you can say they have, you know, they have a user base, a customer base. 
they don't have a product so you sort of went in the right direction any company any decent company would have a product would have a service right but startups don't have a product so you're enhancing something in a in a company which is different because you have some sort of foundation but for startups the thing is you can solve anything in the world that sounds literally like freedom right but unfortunately that's the biggest headache disguised as a blessing why because now you're going to work out what exactly you're going to solve so i know a lot of startups startup founders who started with something like i want to in fact my own sort of the drink prime started with uh, we're sort of india's first uh, smart water purifier on subscription so the founders actually started with we pro- wanted to provide clean and safe drinking water to 60% of india who don't have access to that great what do you want to do right so uh that acts, so what i'm asking what i'm telling now is actually not even the starting point it started way before that and a lot of startup startup so i i in fact uh would be humble enough to say that i was uh, i was the co-founder of a failed startup so we launched something which did not work out blah 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 it was going very slowly but so i know this sort of uh, uh sort of first hand most startup startup uh, start with that kind of an idea i want to change uh, education and this and that right uh, you only need to watch shark tank for what they come up with right right now the problem is so this involves a different level of drill down so i have collated here what uh, sort of uh, some sort of a framework so any of those 50 people who raised their hands earlier and who are mute now uh, all of you Uh, feel free to use this as a framework right this is not uh, something i have invented uh, so all sorts of disclaimers there but comes from y combinator and a whole host of other sources but when we talked of when i gave the other example i talked of who when and what right now just sort of follow along with me oh, too many hand movements right so whom are you trying to help what problem are you solving for them so far so good same as what we were talking about uh, earlier but now when do they have the problem how frequently and how mandatory is the problem so what you do is you maybe you have 50 ideas for a startup right write them down in an excel sheet have these as columns put the answer down and see what the answer uh, honestly answer them and see what the answers are so what i mean by how frequently and mandatory let's say you if you are solving a problem which is a once a year problem let's say tax right so your product would only be used once a year right so you can't be talking uh, st- about stuff like if you have an uh, sort of aspiration that my product would be used by millions of people every day and blah 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 i'll build the next next sort of whatsapp or facebook won't happen right right is it mandatory uh, my earlier startup was where we wanted to help teachers add more value to the students or sort of help the students better etc etc uh, interestingly enough i think we all know this the hard way 70% of the teachers in india are sort of consider it optional to be adding more value to the students and all of that right so if you if something is not mandatory people won't do it same as the mars example why so it as long as something is optional it will sort of you take it for granted sort of that it probably 25% of the people will actually st- uh, end up using it best case scenario right so is your problem so when do people face their problem is it every day right how frequently ideally the ideal startups and there's a good talk by kevin hell of y combinator on this so uh, when do they have this problem ideally every day sh- ideally mandatory problem ideally they don't have a current solution or whatever they do so that problem existed right so they would have done something about it let's say you uh, locofy is a good example people do write code right so it isn't you're just making it easier so currently so how pe- frequently do people write code ev- programmers do it every day is it mandatory yes that's what the salary depends on right now what is the current solution of course code right what is the cost of the current problem it takes x amount of time to do let's say something this is entirely subjective in this context uh, but so the cost of the problem is in terms of time either time or money so put this down and how much is your solution going to help so in locofy's case it might be something like 
it's going to save a couple of hours for medium complexity problems per hour or something like that, right? I'm sure you would have sort of a more exaggerated numbers than what I came up with at runtime, but you get the pro pro thing, right? So put this in an Excel sheet. Uh, this is sort of a well-known sort of framework. Uh, if you're, if you take all the boxes, then great. You do have at least the starting point. Then comes the point where you actually start executing the idea and all of that, right? But when you do this, what you will see is you come up with something that is almost never talked about. Now, uh, uh, this entire uh, page, I'm sort of slide. I'm talking about how do you what how do you figure out what you solve. What is equally important is figuring out what not to solve. You can't solve everything on the planet, right? If I want to solve global warming, I simply can't. What I can possibly do is that there is, there's a landfill or there are plenty of landfills across sort of mini landfills, um, island architecture, so as to speak, uh, in Bangalore itself. And I can have a solution where there's probably some chemical, something which just converts them into thin air, ideally, right? So figuring out what not to solve. Uh, yeah, so that is sort of where I thought I'll end this. And um, I was sort of um, very, very excited. So till this point, any questions? Yes. The right, right at the beginning. So before you identify the so your first step would be, as you said, you can't solve everything for everybody, right? So you identify what, whom are you trying to help? So give me an example. You, I'm sure you have 50 ideas. You seem like a person who has them. Give me one example, one sort of idea you ever had. We'll do a live sort of session on this. Yes, yes, of course. Don't be afraid of giving out your secret. <laughs> <laughs> Not like that. So, so one idea about that is, for example, so if I'm trying to build a kind of an application uh, that can clone your mobile details into my my data, like my when I just place my mobile next to your device, I can get access of your complete. Like I'm stealing your privacy. How many how many spy movies or series have you seen? I, I, I have watched a lot on that. Ah, I, clearly, <laughs> yes. yes. But excellent solution, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to build this and yeah. not go to jail at the same time. Yes. Uh, Just like a hacker with ethical. <laughs> Tip number one: You probably shouldn't be saying these things out loud. Right. So who would your who who would actually use your product? Government. <laughs> government. Where government is everywhere. Take the tax, pay the tax. <laughs> who in the government? <laughs> you can accept someone who can sell tea and then come up. What? <laughs> why would uh, why would our honorable prime minister uh, buy the So he wouldn't be using the product. My question is not who would buy, who would actually use the product? So there are few end customers who need this kind of a product to find out like uh, a chill uh, we have some kind of application right to monitor your kids surveying okay. kind of a things right. so i thought of building some kind of something like that fine again that's a product that's a solution surveillance kits and this and that i'm asking who would be using your product what does their day look like what do they do what that's do they where my r and d starts Cyber security, if you watch a lot of uh, TV series, 
mm-hmm. especially disney hotstar all that you all of that you could have started with raw or something like that <laughs> uh, but yeah get the point so if it is the cyber security cell or is if it is a wing in raw etc etc or those kind of agencies then that's your persona right yes. now this product would be used by not by somebody who is sitting in the back office but somebody who is on the field like cops uh like cops i don't imagine in this example they would be cops but let's go with cops so what do they do why do they need this so which so at which point would the, would you want to copy let's say would somebody i'm not saying sir you would do something like this but if you wanted to copy uh his phone data why would that be don't suspect on me bro <laughs> right so my point is drill down drill down into exactly who is do you want to be using the product what does their sort of day in a life of look look like what to are what are they exactly doing or what do they want to do when they are using the product what do they do at the moment what are the work arounds the r and d that you typically when we say r and d we mean a lot of sort of coders on laptops and labs and this and that that's not the r and d you just here r and d means talking to people right or thinking sort of in an in an empathetic way on behalf of the customers whom you are trying to but do something for right so drill that down and often you would find that when you actually drill it down it doesn't sound as fantastic as it sounded initially but that's okay and every startup does that yeah so right so any other questions yes uh, yeah so my question is basically related to let's say you are having a problem and you are have uh, you have two solutions to it so for example as you were telling that uh, you were designing some solution for a luxury car brand so you placed that service center to three different locations so at the same time you can have a, a solution like you are having that uh, engine health with yourself and you can uh, notify the customer that uh, this is the problem in the car and your car may broke down so this can be another solution but uh, you choose the like first one which you explained so how do you basically evaluate which solution is best for the problem which uh, you are having right we actually went for three parts to the sol- four parts to the solution first would be the iot sort of based self correction that i was that i talked about the second part would be customer self service which was you open the app you point it you open the bonnet point it it would have augmented reality understand what is what and give you some steps of what you can try the customer notification was the third one we sort of light touched it and what i talked about was the fourth one which was sort of uh, what i was most sort of excited about because that had a eureka moment and that had we sort of i thought we achieved something that that was quite unique in sort of the car industry now how do you decide is the question let's say i have to do one right so the question so again if i uh, come back to something like this right the problem that you would wa- so every problem that you solve has a cost attached to it the last but one sort of the last point here right so your the problem has a cost in ter- terms of time and money so in this case customers time right and every solution would save some of that time right now what you and i'll um, uh, if you stick around so uh, i think uh, during the snack session i'll give you the rest of the sheet which has the solution criteria exactly what you are asking but in summary you would figure out which one of your solutions gives the most value right saves the most time in this case then the next point would be the complexity or the time required for you to come up with a solution let's say i have a solution which would sort of uh, save you a thousand rupees versus save you 1 lakh rupees for instance obviously something which saves you 1 lakh rupees is great right but let's say that what that product takes me 10 years to develop whereas this one takes me one month now the decision is different right you'd rather go for the one month one so time to sort of complexity and time to value now time to va- i'm saying time to value not for time for execution or development time from the time you start developing to the time the customer realizes the value that's time to value right so let's say there is a product which people can immediately use blah 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 but they will get the benefit let's say 3 years down the line right so after 50 if you 
yeah yeah brilliant good, good examples for when the time is very huge so any sort of uh, products where the deep uh, deep tech r&d which requires many years open ai chat gpt gpt 353 3.54 is a good example they started in 2015 2016 they pumped 1 billion dollars into it right and now is when they are reaping the benefits out of it right uh, uh, any health tech uh, any equipment would be a good example where the time to value will be large because what you're solving cannot be solved in a short while right but there are plenty of cases where let's say people sort of come to apartments and ask people to sell um, insurance and stuff like that kodak life insurance and you learn so much crores and so much years and all of that right so you can find plenty of tech as well as non-tech examples and you will see that there's a golden rule if your time to value should be very short those are the fastest selling products if your time to value is very high then your value better be really high so these insurance products where they ask those uncles and aunties to start selling insurance to everybody lic and all of that they would actually say if you hear any of them talk the actual pitch they'll say that uncle auntie yeah mr kakkar uh, they started uh, selling insurance and they are now earning they, this guy earned 2.5 2 crores last year so if the time to value is high that value has to be very high so that way sort of things balance each other Yes. Uh, so you're saying time to value, but like uh, in the car example, it could be a different factor, like profitability. For example, you said you skipped the third part of customer notification went for the fourth. So yesterday I gave my bike for service, and one of the parts had completely broken down. And if I had noticed that it was broken down earlier, I could have saved uh, 2,000, 3,000 rupees. So we did give customer notification. I li we light touched it. The reason I mentioned, use that term, is that what we figured out is that the customer, so we were sending five, one, between one to five GBs of IoT data to the backend. Now the customer definitely does not want to know all, the, all that. So we figured out what is the minimum sort of set of things or insights that he or she would want to know. And that's what was available in the dashboard and app and all of that. Yeah, yeah, of course. So they did get the notification. They did get all of that. The thing is that especially not true here, but let's say you're out and about in the wilds, right? Where there is nobody, especially in the UK, there are plenty of places where you have sort of, in, you're in the middle of mountains driving in a very scenic place and there is nobody there, right? So you would go to places like that. So the, in those kind of geographies, it becomes, this is a very valid scenario where the customer might know, right? But then they're driving for 500 kilometers, right? So there, it might be have been fine while he, when he left the home, but then it would break down in between for some reason. That kind of a suggestion would be there. This is something that I have had debates with plenty of people. Now, I want to get a vote. So how many think that sort of, how many, I think data privacy is overrated today. Anybody agrees with me? Yes, so for all those who doesn't, let's say if, so uh, if you're not, if you're not being charged for the product, then you are the product and all that good stuff, right? Um, which can be fit in sort of Twitter 140 characters. Great, great moral science lessons. But if I, it, for me, if I go to a petrol pump and he says that, uh, bhaiya, aapka email ID, phone number de do, aapko petrol free mein de denge, I will rather, I'll give that. Right? So, there's, there's a thin line between sort of uh, privacy being uh, overused and abused in today's world, in my view, uh, and that. So, something which is actually harmful uh, for, uh, if sort of data, pri so if, nobody would be collecting any data then you would have a pretty bad experience you'd see austrian videos when you launch youtube and stuff like that so obviously since that doesn't happen there is some merit to it right otherwise how the internet experience would be pretty poor and so on. same would be for many other things now for privacy uh, luckily it is not in uk and a lot of uh, in european countries it is not le left to the subjective judgment of uh, people like me 
but rather there are very clearly defined laws on what can or cannot be shared and the regulations are such that you have to actually sort of open it out share what you are um, uh, collecting and storing and all of that uh, so apart from sort of anything which identifies a user so for example name and the phone number email id and address at the same time if this were a package then you're not supposed to store this in a public cloud but if you store those separately and you're not joining them up in a public cloud the address itself right doesn't make any sense to anybody right so i can say something like hsr layout flat this flat that how do you know it's my house it actually isn't by the way uh, so yeah so those laws exist there so we were pretty fine in that but then i do feel that it is over abused i was yeah excited to see that nobody agreed with me but let's go ahead <laughs> seriously you wouldn't give i love freelancers yes <laughs> yes Yeah, and in some cases it's pretty irritating. I don't know how, why, for a, even for a pandukan, uh, people ask me for the phone numbers these days. Your uh, address, bill, can I get it? Sorry. The whole situation that you mentioned about uh, the car breaking down and then. Car repair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
uh, I'll give you, so I'll, I'll connect this to a hotspot and then uh, do the work. Yeah, so, maybe you, uh, you can keep this like this. Are, when, unfortunately, as techies, there are, there is literally no option for us to walk away saying tech issues. This <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> option is in the rest of the world. Yeah, because right now I'm saying it works on my system. <laughs> Good one. Yeah, I actually looked at, uh, looked up a lot of, uh, I typed uh, in the morning react, react native jokes. I didn't dare. But anyways, uh, so yeah, bad demos aside, uh, I'll fix this and then uh, you can. Uh, yeah, you can scan yeah. it maybe after the break. Can yeah, yeah. Just take a photo. Uh, okay. gr great. Uh, I think we'll take a like 20 minute break and after that we have three more talks. So I think uh, uh, you can use this time to grab some coffee and you know, can also network. I'll use this time to fix this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talk to others. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry for uh, having less number of chairs. We kind of underestimated the number of people who will attend. So we didn't have some chairs. Sorry about that. How do I test? Uh, uh, switch you plugged in already? Yeah, I just plugged in. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's visible here. Yeah, it's visible here. Yeah. All right. Ah, uh, okay.
ये वाला अगले हम एडजस्ट करो अपना वो, वो फिक्स कर लिया तो इज्जत की बात है ना एक इसको मैं बस ये लगा के चला जाऊंगा ताकि इसको इसको ये है नहीं अब यू कैन क्लोज इट क्लोज इट डाउन हियर क्लोज इट ना क्लोज इट
microphone on now and then we get the job done, right? Really? Okay. So, like, how do you find uh, people to hire you? Do you? Like, is there a website or something like this? Or?
what is it? Uh, Radisson Blue Hotel. Oh, I saw that post, yes. And uh, Lambda Test, I think, joined your sponsors or something like that. Uh, Recently. Geek, 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 yeah. Geek, ah, Geek, Geek, yeah. 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 yeah, this year was slightly dull. Seriously? Dull in the sense, you know, a lot of companies are in cost cutting mode, right? Ah, that is true. Last year we got like really good number of sponsors mm. and it was very easy in the sense, you know. Now, uh, whenever we reach some company, you're like, they're like, okay, we are in cost cutting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I tried something with mine. <laughs> yeah, I was not able to even bypass my manager. My manager is doing nothing is going to work. Uh, this year? Yeah, if we have money, we would hire a person or not. <laughs> Donate to the audience. It's not about running, it's a marketing challenge. We do not want that to be currently. Shubham, uh, have you reached the venue? Uh, okay, can, can you come inside? Okay. Akash, I think he has given a talk already. Yeah, he's here. Yeah. 
disconnect this? No, this link works, by the way. Yeah, mine is connected. No, I think it's not the Vivo guest. No, no, it's my hotspot. I don't know why it's not working. Vivo guest did work. Yeah, it was not working. Yeah, I disabled it. I do not. <coughs> is it my phone which is creating the issue? Maybe, like, say, uh, can you help me connect to this Viva uh, guest? connected did it ask for any name yeah it just okay there is a connect one okay uh, uh internet issue I'll just connect to the guest it's it's connected actually. That is what connected, right? It will pop up one more test just disconnect and connect it.
Hello. Hello. Is everyone back? <laughs> okay. Hi, 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 hi. Guys talking on the front rows. Okay. Okay, hi. Uh, so, my name is Shubham Nateria. I am currently the co founder and CTO at Custive. And I'm here to talk to you guys about building real time and collaborative applications. So, these can be web applications, mobile applications, or, or any, any sort of applications in general. Uh, before I start my talk, I actually want to talk to you guys about the inspiration behind why I wanted to talk about this, why we are building on something uh, like this and the applications of it, etc, etc. So at Custive, what we do is at Custive, we build software for manufacturing. So we are a digital contract manufacturing platform where we work with clients like l and Adani's, uh, Tata's of the world uh, for handling the complete manufacturing projects. So uh, in manufacturing, there are multiple stakeholders across the board who use a piece of software. So what happens is using uh, one web platform and if someone updates something on one side, the update has to be propagated throughout the system to the other stakeholders who are using that software. Uh, similar examples are ex softwares like Figma, Google Docs, Google Sheets, uh, Notion, Miro, etc. Right. So previously, uh, like before founding Custive, I worked extensively across banking and healthcare building uh, software applications for uh, across, massively across those two sectors. And in the, those, those two sectors, I faced similar problems of being able to build collaborative applications fast. Because if, as anyone here, worked on such platforms where you've had to build software where multiple people have to be on the same side and do that stuff? No, not not at all. Like, right? So I, if, if you've built systems like that, you would generally tend to use uh, uh, things like Firebase or real-time databases, PowerDB, PowerDB, uh, and uh, have to set up your own channels for transmitting data, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of engineering goes into the system. Plus, managing networking is a big, big, big pain. Uh, scaling backend systems, again, is a big, big, big pain, right? So it's not very straightforward to be able to build these systems. But today, software is going towards the point where collaborative software is becoming a need for, of the art, especially for developers uh, like you and me who have to write such software without having to spend so much time on, on, on this piece. We can, we can, uh, we should spend our time on better things uh, to build, uh, right? So, so which is why I, I wanted to talk to you about. Now, this talk is going to be very conceptual. It's not going to go extensively technical, uh, in, uh, technically, it's not, it's not a technical oriented talk. It's, it's more to give you, uh, it's more for you to get, uh, to get some appreciation uh, on what it takes for someone, say, say, say someone at Figma to be able to build the software that they are building and how does that software scale and how does that software function, uh, right? So at, uh, to start off with, we'll just define the terms. What is a real-time application? What is a collaborative application? These two are two separate things. So a real-time application essentially just means that data from one system has to be shown to other systems whenever there is a change on the, on system one. So now examples of this are real time dashboards, uh, your financial systems where it has to be constantly updated, and the general architecture of such such systems is that uh, they, these are connected by sockets and uh, generally by sockets you can have other network protocols as well. But there is a source and there is a sync. There is someone who is creating the data and there's other people who are. Uh, ingesting, like who are consuming that data, right? So for example, in a real-time dashboard, there's someone who is going to be changing those parameters. So in a manufacturing setup, for example, there'll be uh, information from machines will be changing those parameters and you and I who are using the software will be able to see those details on our screen updating in real time. Now, collaborative applications, uh, on the other hand, need to transmit data in real time and also the data needs to be in sync across the clients. Now, the second point brings in a lot of engineering overhead. Why? Because your nodes now have to be both a source and a sync. Like you have to consume that data, but you also need to produce the uh, to be able to produce that data which syncs across different clients. And examples, obviously, as I said, was things like uh, your Google G Suite, uh, Figma, and uh, Miro. Uh, what goes into building collaborative applications is now what we'll talk about. So throughout this talk, I'll just use a simple example of building something as simple as a to-do application, which, which simply is just uh, an, an array of, of, of objects which contains a text and whether or not that to-do is done. Simple as that. Now, what we will be building is, say there are three nodes, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. These are the th three clients or whoever is using the software. They are now uh, on, and this software has to run on all of these three clients, and they, they should be able to see 
uh, whatever whoever is changing and they should also be able to propagate their own updates uh, right so just basic requirements of a collaborative application. So if I'm building something like this, what does it need to be? So first of all, collaborative and multiplayer software are a problem of distributed systems. If any one of you here has worked on uh, distributed uh, databases, this, the, the, this problem is the most similar to that because you need to have data replicas on each node and those data replicas need to be in sync. There's one change here that I will talk about, but essentially it boils, the problem boils down to a data replication problem, which is a uh, well-researched problem in distributed systems. Second, the data must be strongly consistent for every collaborator. Now, what consistency means is that everyone needs to be on the same state of data at any given point of time, right? Because if we diverge, for example, if you use something like Git, in Git, when you diverge, like when, when multiple developers are working and someone diverges and you need to merge your changes back, you can do so manually. Like you can tell the system what to merge and what not to merge. But in a software like this, the software needs to take care of those merges. It has to be automatic. And it has to be automatic in a way that it converges. What that means is that the data, the decisions should be same for each node so that everyone is always on the same state. Because once you diverge, there are, there are a ton of problems that happen to make you come back to the original state. And the, the replications are very, very bad because that can change data on your backend. Uh, that, that will, some user will just be shown some random garbage and things like that. Uh, and uh, absolutely terrible. So, and collaborators should also be uh, able to write at the same time. Again, this is the collaborators can be a source and a sync problem, right? You have to be able to see the updates in real time and also be able to write to the system in real time. Local first. Now, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, what happens is, for example, say if you work on a system like Google Docs, uh, Google Sheets, any of G Suite software, say two people are working on, on Google Docs together. One of you goes offline, both of you go offline for that matter. You make, you have one copy of the document, you've made your changes. When you come back online, it, it absolutely, the, the resulting output um, is absolutely garbage, by the way. Like, I don't know if you've ever used it, but if it's the same document, editing the same paragraph, uh, it's absolute garbage. Why not if we can, uh, the problem here is, can we build systems that don't require central servers like Google Docs does? So that if you and I are connected to the same hotspot, we have the application loaded on our uh, on our front end. If I'm making the changes, why do I need to be connected to a server for my changes to propagate to you? Right. So that's the whole concept of a local first application that I should be able to work on offline. When I go back online, my changes should merge with everyone in the network. And I should also get the changes that everyone else in the network has made. Right. Uh, partitions should not cause systemic failures. What this, what a partition, I don't know if you guys, uh, does anyone know here what the cap theorem is? Right? So what, what partitions generally mean is one node going offline or one node just dis being disconnected from the system in, 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 in uh, simple languages. So that should not cause your entire system to fail. Like if I'm writing a collaborative application, if there are 10 users using it, say even if three of them go offline or something bad happens to that application, something crashes, it should not affect the remaining system. What that also, uh, from a developer's point of view, you have to think about what happens to your data then. Right? If three of the users have gone offline, crashed, whatever has happened, wh what happens to your data then? Et cetera, right? so, so these are some basic requirements that a collaborative application needs to have. This is a very, very important term that we will talk about strong eventual consistency. Now, this is a topic that is separate, that separates uh, the problem of distributed databases to the problem of collaborative applications. In distributed databases, all your replicas have to be in sync at any given point of time. There is no point where a replica A is not having the same data as replica B, right? So extensively studied problem. Eventual, strong eventual cons uh, consistency means that I don't have to be in sync with you at any given, like at like every given point of time. If I'm not in sync with you right now, I can be in sync with you in, in a time in the future given the fact that I have received all the changes that you have made. So that is a uh, assurance to the system that you as a developer have to give, right? As long as you can propagate the changes from one client to the other, the cl uh, clients uh, A, B, and C, X, Y, and Z will always be in uh, sync in a given point of time. This is the assumption that we make. Right, now just quickly to talk about con consensus and convergence. So consensus uh, differs from convergence in a way that uh, say if I have two documents on Google Docs, right? Say if I, if I, if Alice types that the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog and Bob also has the same text, then Alice makes a change changing the dog to cat. Uh, Bob makes a change changing the cat to the mouse. 
consensus in the system would mean that I can have only one of each, like either of these these two. Uh, guys who are who here who work on blockchain will understand this concept well, right? So you can't have both the values. You have you'll have only one, right? So I can either have cat or mouse as my final state. Convergence, on the other hand, which is very very important for collaborative applications, means that I have to have both. I can't ignore a user's changes. Right, it, it, because if I'm editing that text and you are editing that text, I can't just go and say that I'm going to disregard your text. Uh, uh, th these algorithms can vary a lot depending on your end use case, but generally you can't ignore what other users are doing. So now, what, what does it take to build a collaborative to-do application? We've, uh, so let's consider three agents. All the three agents have an array of three items, three to-dos. Uh, say Alice makes a change, and uh, by the way, we, we'll only consider two operations here. So we only consider that you can insert after an index and you can delete element at a specific index to just keep things very simple, right? So now say Alice inserts one, uh, inserts after index one to do 2.5. Uh, they make the change to their local copy, and after making a change to their local copy, they propagate the changes to all the peers. Now this can happen either through a centralized system or through a P2P system, depending on your use case. But as long as the changes have gone to the other peers, they will also make changes to the local copy and everyone stays in sync, right? But uh, there are a lot of problems. When, when, if, when you think about this from a computer networking perspective, there are a ton of problems that will happen to this. If anyone's written computer networks, you know this. Like anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Like uh, you, you can't just take anything for granted when you're writing distributed systems. Messages might drive out of order. So in our example, now what happens when, uh, say, Alice makes a change, but the changes don't go in this order, and say Bob makes a change, but changes don't go in the same order to your third agent, which is Charlie. So say I've inserted, I've, I've done insert uh, 0, 1.5, I've made change to my local copy, and then I've propagated the changes to my peers. S now what happens is, say, they've received the changes. Immediately after receiving my change, Bob decides to make another change. Right now, think of it in this way. Bob and Charlie are uh, are very close close by. Like, say, Bob and Charlie are both sitting in Bangalore, sitting in this room. But Alice is far off in America, and it there is a uh, there is around 250 milliseconds of latency that it takes from a for a packet from anywhere, say, in San Francisco to reach Bangalore. Right. So that's a finite amount of time. That's a good amount of time to consider in any application like this. So Bob will now make that change. So you see, the state of Alice and Bob currently are in sync. As soon as Bob makes that change, they will do change their uh, local copy and they will propagate the changes to their peers. So it sends, sends it to Alice and Charlie. But what happens is that Charlie gets Bob's packet first and then my packet, right? So now when Charlie applies these operations to their local copy, uh, like uh, the, the dotted one is the one uh, that they currently have and then after first operation and this is after second operation, right? They go out of sync. And uh, for a system like this, there is no way to know which user is in sync or is not in sync, right? If you want to design something like that, it comes with tremendous overheads. Second problem, messages might arrive twice. What do you do? So, for example, uh, in this sort of a system, you have to ensure that the packets reach your clients at least once, right? The, 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 that guarantee has to be given to the, by the system. So, say Alice makes this change. They say insert after 0, 1, 1.5, right? Now, Bob, the, the message is sent to Bob. Bob makes a change on the local copy. They've sent back an act to Alice saying that, okay, I've received the thing, I've made that change, but that act does not reach uh, back to Alice. There can be tons of reasons for this, some sort of packet loss due to network failure, uh, due to some cable being cut somewhere, etc., etc., etc. Then Bob, but Alice has to send that packet to Bob, so they retransmit the packet saying that, okay, you have to make, you have to insert after 0, 1.5. Alice, the Bob has now made that change twice to the local copy, but Bob has no way to know whether or not this was intended, but they just assume that, okay, if Alice has sent me this instruction, I'm going to execute that onto my local copy. So how do we achieve data consistency and data convergence uh, is what we are going to talk about now. So there are two ways that the two topics of research that are going extensively in distributed systems that help us to do this. First of which is something called Operational Transform. Operation Transform, by the way, is how your Google Docs work. So Google Docs is a heavy and a, actually a very successful use case of OTs being able to be uh, developed and put into practice at, at, at a massive scale. Because operational transforms are a group of algorithms where operations on any given data structure 
transmitted between clients are transformed in a way that state across the clients is maintained when they are executed, right? Uh, what this means is, is very simple. So for example, now again coming back to Alice and Bob. So uh, say you have an array of four uh, uh, elements, and but the thing about operational transform is you have to have a server in between. Every message has to go through a server because the server has to know what is happening to the data, etc. right? So the server will also have their local copy. Now say, uh, so yeah, they maintain all the data and all comms have to pass through it. Now say Alice makes this change, right? So they say they, they do insert uh, 0, 1.5. After they've made that change, the, the data is sent to the server, uh, right? And, and at the same time, by the way, Bob, Bob has also made a change saying that you have to delete element at two, right? Both of that, those packets are sent to the server. The insert 0, 1.5 comes first, uh, then the delete two comes. But the server is smart enough to know that before the index to the element and element has been added. So you don't have to delete the element at two. You actually have to delete the element at three because if you see the logic, uh, if you see the uh, thing on top, so if you do insert after zero, 1.5, but if you delete two, things will go wrong. Things will just go out of sync. Uh, you don't know what's going on in the system and the system breaks, it diverges, it can never converge back. So that's why they've, they've transformed the operation to state that, uh, to, to be able to maintain sync across clients and those are the operations that are now transmitted to your different clients. So your clients are now in sync. Uh, pros and cons are uh, obviously, uh, they, they've been developed successfully for data structures like strings and, and therefore also arrays and have massive scale applications like Google Docs. They're extremely difficult to implement and debug. These algorithms have been a topic of research for almost uh, two decades now, more than that actually. Uh, extremely, extremely difficult to implement at scale. People at Google who did it are absolutely brilliant, but other people have tried it. Even guys at Figma, for example, tried it for a while, but really it didn't work out for them. Extremely difficult to def uh, implement and debug. And yeah, and you now have a single point of failure. If your server, if anything in your server goes wrong, uh, it, it's just gone, right? So your yeah, so server becomes a single point of failure, it also becomes a bottleneck for throughput. So if you want to scale your systems, it's heavily dependent on your server to be able to handle that sort of bottle, bottleneck and, and horizontal scaling issues. The second uh, and the more interesting point of uh, research and, and things that have been put into practice are something called conflict free replicated data types. Uh, as opposed to operational transforms, CRDTs are a data structure. They are not just an algorithm. So these are these are a kind of data data structure that have the properties of convergence uh, built into them. So these allow you to replicate to to update any replica independently, con concurrently, without coordinating with other replicas. So these this family of data structure essentially lets you send your changes to anyone else in the world. And if they are also using the same data structure, you should be able to do it concurrently and without having to worry about what happens and without having to worry about things going out of sync. It automatically resolves any inconsistencies that occur. <laughs> that which means that uh, in, 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 our, in our previous example, when we saw that delete three and the insert uh, example, those sort of things don't have to be taken care of now by a central server. Uh, things in a data structure, the logic in the data structure itself takes care of that. Uh, although replicas may have a difference at any particular point of time, they eventually, they're guaranteed to uh, eventually converge. A strong eventual consistency uh, is the point that we had, uh, discussed about. Uh, this is also, by the way, used at SoundCloud, Redis, Facebook, and Apple. Redis, a lot of Redis data structures is built on CRDT. So if, uh, if, if you ever study about how uh, Redis uh, scales the replicas, how, how it manages data across different servers, a lot of that is based on CRDTs. Figma also, by the way, uses this. So how do CRDTs achieve this? Now CRDTs achieve this by having three uh, mathematical properties, please don't kick me for taking you back to math class, but uh, they have to be idempotent. Now what that means is that any, any an update from one pair can be applied multiple times and the result should be the same, right? So that, that, that takes care of things like same message, message arriving twice problem. So if I'm sending you that same packet again and again, sending you the same instruction again and again, your data structure should be able to know that, that that's the same instruction and that therefore either, and, and actually they can even apply it if they want, but if they don't, uh, but they can choose not to apply it, but, but they have to maintain this property. Second is being commutative. Now, uh, commutative again means that changing the order of uh, uh, the operands does not change the result. 
simply put, if you have, uh, if there's a binary operation on a set, it's commutative only if, if, if x opt y is equal to y op x, right? In our case, x and y are states and uh, your op is the merge operator. So given two states, if you merge them, it doesn't matter if you merge A uh, first and then B, like if you do A, A op B or if you do B op A, the output should be the same. The third is associative, which means that changing the order of parentheses in the operation does not really matter which. So if you have a binary, of, if you have an operation uh, on a set S, it's, a, it's a, and if you change uh, the order of the parentheses, the output is still the same. What commutative and associative in our case mean is that we don't have to worry about ordering because ordering in networking is a huge pain. So it doesn't matter how you're setting up your system, maintaining that sequence is, is absolutely a huge pain and things go wrong. And in our case, the, the penalty of, a, of something not being in order is absolutely uh, terrible because you can just completely diverge from your main state and coming back now to your original state uh, is it's absolutely difficult. So you have to not worry about order, which is what the last two properties give you. Uh, you can use uh, any sort of networking protocol. So, so I don't want, so in, in this talk, for example, I don't want to go into the details of being able to develop systems like this, right? Because there are a lot of uh, implementations out there and that actually deserves a whole series of lectures to itself. Like you'll have to go a lot, and you'll have to understand things like uh, order theory and, and stuff like that to be able to uh, understand how these data structures actually work. But uh, even understanding basics of this will help you use uh, data structures out there. For, for example, there, there are solutions like YJS, AutoMerge, uh, et cetera, that will help you build applications like this, uh, right? To be able to just use the data structures out of the box and to be able to build applications like this. Networking protocol. So we, we didn't talk about networking because networking is a well-studied topic uh, and a lot of you here, all of you here in fact, who have developed applications that have used uh, different networking protocols. So some common networking protocols that we can use here is WebSockets, your WebRTCs, mesh networks, and gossip protocols. Uh, the thing with CRDTs now is that since you don't need a central server for being able to coordinate and do things between multiple replicas, you can just do peer-to-peer. -peer. So in our first uh, in, a, in our first discussion, uh, say if I'm building Google Docs based on CRDTs, I now don't need to be able to be connected to a central server. So if all of us here are sitting in the same room, we have a copy of the app loaded, we are connected to the same Wi-Fi network, we can all just collaborate on that data. And once any any one of us comes online, it's connected to the internet, all of that data is now synced with your backend, right? These are common implemented. So all of these data structures, for example, are, are well studied in the CRDT ecosystem and have been implemented uh, uh, well. So you can just use any of this out of the box and, and be able to use all of this in your applications. Again, uh, it, it comes with its own pros and cons. Pros is yes, you get strong eventual consistency. Uh, there's no dependency on a central server, so you can transmit P2P. Uh, there's low complexity uh, because uh, you don't have to develop intensive algorithms to be able to do all of this stuff because I gave you problems, I gave you just two problems uh, in, in networking. So your server packets arriving twice or your packets arriving out of order. But there are a lot of things that can also go wrong and you know the permutation combination of that can lead your OT algorithms to just go crazy. Which is also why they are absolutely difficult to be able to implement and, and to be able to execute. But with CRDT since you don't have to worry about a central algorithm, it's all of that logic is built into your data structure. You can just use that out of the box and not worry about uh, all of that uh, complication. But the con here is a huge amount of metadata is stored on your data structure for you to be able to allow this. Now, uh, just to give you an example, uh, say if you're using an array, the, the typical size of a CRDT array would be anywhere from three to five times the original size of your array at minimum because it needs to store a good amount of information for it to know what is going on and for it to be able to do all of these things that we have spoken about. Cool, so uh, after, I'm, I'm going too fast. That's fine. Okay. So uh, after doing all of this, so I've been studying this problem for some time now. I've been very interested in this because there is no out of the box solution for for developers like you and me to be able to use and develop systems like this. It takes for if you study uh, Figma's problem, uh, Figma has been working on this for a very long time, and it took them a couple of years uh, to be able to crack multiplayer extensively at the skill at which we are, which they are doing right now. Right. So for for uh, startups like mine and for for our teams, it becomes very difficult to be able to develop uh, real time collaborative systems, even develop basic features, and it takes an insane amount of engineering. Which is why I wanted to work on a software package called. Uh, Wire, I know there's a Web3 wire also, but uh, uh, the software package called Wire, because the thought process was, what if we had a JavaScript object that was a CRDT and also a real-time shared data type? 
So if there is a JavaScript map that you're using and you, if, you, if you change something on your system, the change re uh, reflects automatically onto every connected pair uh, of that data structure. Like what if you can just build that into JavaScript itself is what the thought was when I, when, when I started building this. So how, so now, for example, I have a bit out there, I'll, I'll talk about the demo also in a bit, but how does it work right now? So right now how it works is there's a hook. So there's a use sync hook that we provide you. So if you use that hook, you give a unique data ID to your data and you give it any JavaScript data structure in, in, in the data field over there. Then you just initialize the data. What happens is now this will register you to the backend. We, we do have a backend because we do some room management, but the longer goal is to be able to do P2P as well. Uh, so it reg registers you to the backend and syncs you with all your existing clients. But the return data structure, the, the, the data variable there now is a normal JavaScript object that if you use as a normal JavaScript object, syncs your data to everyone using the same ID. Now you have a JSON data structure that is a CRDT, so you can do collaboration on it. And the data structure itself handles real-time communication, so you don't have to worry about uh, doing any of that stuff. You just have to use this hook and it does all of that magic out of the box. So that's what you get. So I'll just quickly walk you through uh, some use cases and implementations uh, of this. For example, So first, quickly, so I, I'll just walk you through this. So here, uh, we use, so we write this hook. So the use sync hook that I showed you earlier, uh, we'll just write this hook here and I'll just show you how that essentially works. So uh, this hook, what, so what the data structure, what our, what our library does right now is basically, uh, you have a sync manager, so you create your data structure using that manager. Uh, you give it your data as a param. I, I'll not walk into what this does. So basically, ref ID is a unique ID that you have to give to the library for it to be able to initialize your data. And the last is you have to give it an onChange function. What happens when something changes? Now, this is a change function that will trigger either if you've changed it or any of your peers have changed this data, right? Uh, you can use this system now to be able to build a hook that 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 makes your app reactive and that serves as a local state. Uh, uh, variable for your app. So in this case, the use state exactly does that. So we have uh, 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 the line number 12 shows you this uh, uh, value that is basically incremented whenever there is a change that happens, right? Does that make sense? Okay, okay. Uh, so the next thing is how do we use this in an application? So, so similarly, how we were talking about problems in that to-do app, uh, if you have something like this, you can just, um, you you just uh, import that hook. You uh, uh, you take that information. You base you give it your initial data. You initialize it with a room name. So room name here is basically a unique data ID, right? Uh, anyone with in the same room or having the same data ID will will be able to be in sync, and you get this loaded data variable. This loaded data variable uh, is now is now what becomes your sync data structure. Any change to this data in this manner, like for example, if you see here in our, in our change handlers, uh, whatever change we do to this data, we don't have to worry about any of the networking stuff. So you just make a change to that data structure and you can be assured that all of that will be propagated uh, to your clients. I'll just run up a quick demo of this also. So now they, these are two separate windows, by the way. So, so two users are now in the same room, right? Now, if user one makes any adds any information, that information or, or is propagated automatically to user two, who doesn't have to really do anything now. So, so you use that information and you just update your state automatically. Then uh, the, the state update is left to the developer, so you can decide how do you want to optimize your rendering, uh, but. Uh, you can just do that out of the box. So if anyone wants to enter anything, do any change, it's replicated in real time to, to the other users. It even supports uh, text for now. 
right? So, and all of this is happening in real time, right? So, so it just happens automatically. Even uh, merge conflicts, conflicts that can otherwise happen over your wire, everything can is taken care of by the library. The second and more interesting example I want to get into is uh, something that uh, I'm sure some of you here have developed previously. Now, so, so this example essentially displays a present system, right? And we use it with, with generic data structures. I'll show you the code for this as well. But, but essentially what happens here is using the same system now, you can build on top of it to be able to develop systems like awareness, systems like presence, things that happen on softwares like say Figma or Miro for all that matter. So in, in this example, you can see that the mouse position is being tracked. I am I'm on the left side of the screen right now. So I'm moving my mouse on, mouse on the left side of the screen. Uh, with some lag, you're seeing it on the right as well. Uh, other things like mouse states, for example, right now I'm pressing my uh, my mouse button. So it's, it updates the state on the other screen as well. If I'm dragging my mouse button, if I'm dragging my cursor, all of this, all of these things can be propagated across multiple clients, and you can build interesting software systems uh, like this. So, quick uh, code for this is something like so, right? So here our, our data structure is is so like we we only store the user's current mouse position, the state of the uh, user's mouse right now, the name of the user, and the color of the user because we assign a unique color to each uh, user. And, and uh, the, the rest of the code is really, really simple. We use it internally in the same way as you would uh, to modify any data structure. So, uh, but the good thing about this is just that if you see the code, as a, as a developer, you don't have to worry about anything. You just have to directly plug that value into your cursor. You just tell the cursor what the mouse position is. You just tell the cursor what the user name is. Just tell the cursor what the user color is, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, the library takes care of the rest. Right. Yeah. So, so that was my talk. I just wanted to come and talk to you guys about this. Talk to you guys about uh, something in uh, in how uh, real time collaborative systems are built. It was very brief. It was uh, we just touched upon some basic topics. But if you guys have any questions, uh, I'm sure my details will be on on the React uh, this events page. So you'll be able to find me. So if you have any questions right now, I'm uh, I'm up for taking them. No question. See, that depends on the, uh, that, that is totally left to the developers. So right, right now we are using WebSockets, uh, WebSockets and HTTP, but you can also use TCP, probably not UDP because UDP does not guarantee data delivery, right? So probably not uh, UDP, but you can use WebSockets, TCP, anything that you want. And uh, what about, like, say, you said agnostic about the protocol which we are using? Yes, because the network layer is totally different from the way that the data structure is structured, right? So the network is, yeah. the network is only used to transmit those changes. So if I made a change, I send that change over the network, and that network now takes care of transmitting it to the other clients, right? So even if you want to use, say, pops up system, say if you want to use Firebase pops up for your network, for all that matter, right? You can just plug that in and you can use it. Okay, so basically, you mean, like, say, uh, you will be able to provide that piece of the code. Can you show me which piece of the code which initiates that connection? Not right now. It's not built in right now, but the plan is yes. Right now, as I said, it's just based on general web sockets. But uh, the transport is completely separate from the logic of the of the data structure itself, right? So we can just plug and play with any transport that we want. So the algorithm of maintaining that consistency is what uh, is built into Yes, exactly. That, that's what built, is built into the data structure itself. Okay. Got it. Okay. Is it open source? This is not open source, no, unfortunately. Okay, no. and the uh, second question is, uh, like what happens in the server? So, so server is very dumb. So server essentially right now what it does, it just maintains rooms. Right. So, so for, for example, think of it as a very simple socket IO room implementation, right? So, uh, the right now it's just doing that because we plan to eliminate the servers for this sort of thing going forward. Right? We want to make this P2P. There's a couple of problems with uh, P2P things like NAT traversal and all that. Uh, once that is solved to some level, we should be able to do P2P uh, state forward. But server right now is, is just basically whenever you connect to the server, it just stores, it doesn't store your any any of your data right now. It just basically knows when a packet has come, who to send it to.
oh it takes a massive amount of engineering so if you talk to any game developer who developed real time gaming systems it takes a massive amount of engineering to be able to enable multiplayer sync now um, not exactly sure about what they sh are using right now but what they can use are generally things like uh, any sort of pop sub architecture producer consumer pattern where your uh, producers and consumers can like your consumers will become your back end your producer can produce and send it to the remaining uh, guys Uh, by the way, we are running out of time. Directly, uh, maybe can you connect via Twitter or something? Because we are running out of time. Sorry about that. Maybe you can connect uh, after the talk. Thank you. Done. So uh, all the speakers contacts details are there on the meetup page. If you want to connect with the speakers later, you can check the meetup page. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shlok, and I'm here to talk about accessibility. So before I start, I would like to ask uh, how many of you know what accessibility is? OK. And how much uh, you implement it in your you know da daily daily codes? Okay, quite less. Okay, so I will try to share what I have learned with you, and uh, maybe I will try to learn from you guys as well. Okay, so the reason that I have chosen this title is because usually when we are you know talking about developing a website, the first thing that comes to mind that how good that looks or how you know easily uh, how easy the UI is how easily everything is you know can be accessed if i go and click on let's say uh, your product what your product does like the about button or something like that so in that case uh, you know it should be there in the top you know the user can or the uh, anyone who is vis visiting your website for the first time can see it and you know it will be easily accessible to use so that is the first thing but the main the one thing that we always miss is that we are looking uh, at an audience who is you know who is able to see the screen and you know operate on it using the mouse but what about people who are not able to see the screen who are using only keyboard or you know some assistive technologies to operate or visit your product or anything like that so my talk will be focused on those uh, scenarios okay so yeah i will quickly describe about what accessibility is why it's important and you know who the end users are who get benefited from this how to implement it and you know how to test it Okay, so yeah, basically accessibility is uh, you know making no bias to anyone. Like anyone who is using the internet should be able to use the you 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 should be able to use the website that you have or the product you have without any you know uh, hindrance. And uh, the you know the reason that we should be you know taking consider you know in consideration about this accessibility is basically uh, you know internet is basically for everyone. You cannot say that uh, only one group of people should be accessing, you know, the internet. So it's basically, you know, an equal access to everyone, and it's the law in many countries, not in India, but uh, like Australia, UK, US. It is a mandatory law to implement accessibility in your website. Sorry. Okay. So the end users are that are benefited from this is everyone. Um, let me like the one small example that we use is that when we want to switch tabs between you know when we are working and you know uh, switching tabs between your VS Code and your Chrome, so use Alt Tab. Now if I say that I remove that feature completely from all devices, so what will happen? You have to go you know click on the Chrome, go see the result, then uh, you know click on the VS Code, do some changes. So th this is also a part of a, you know form of accessibility that you are able to use it in some way. So yes, uh, not only the people, uh, we everyone that is using uh, your website is you know benefited from this. 
Now, there are many types of disabilities uh, that are, you know, physical, visual, speech, and cognitive. But uh, I'm totally focusing on the visually impaired people uh, who are, you know, uh, in this talk we will discuss about them. Okay, so one thing is that um, the visually impaired people they don't have, you know, they can't use the mouse because they can't see your screens. So what they do is they usually either, you know, uh, navigate the website through the, uh, you know, the arrow keys or the uh, tab key. So if you see when you uh, if they when, when they once they log in in their computer, uh, what they do is. Uh, you know, they, they use the arrow keys to operate through the whole document, the whole folder and everything. So, uh, you know, that's the, that's their basic way. We use it, you know, we just use our mouse or any, anything that we like, but for them, it's the, it's their foundation. Okay. Um, who maintains this? So basically there is a written set of rules, you know, uh, which is known as WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines which basically define that, okay, you have to use uh, these type of rules to implement the accessibility and these should be mandatory, they should be um, uh, implemented like that. So basically there are three levels uh, that, you know, uh, basically uh, are implemented. The A, level A, that is the most basic level, you will have it in your website. And the double A is the most common one that is, you know, we usually use to, you know, uh, implement in our websites. Triple uh, A is the highest level of accessibility. It it uh, basically says that you know uh, it should be fully accessible. So that is uh, pretty hard to implement. So basically, uh, accessibility is not something that uh, you know you say that these are a uh, few things that we will do and your website will become highly accessible. It's an ever learning process. If a website is made accessible, it can be made more accessible. It can be made uh, better. So yeah, it's an ever learning process. Okay, so um, I would like to discuss about uh, semantic tags. I think uh, everybody uh, already knows about it. So basically, uh, semantic tags are the ones that you know they are uh, they are the tags that convey the things that uh, you know they say according to the name to their name. So basically, if there is a button, that means it's a button. If you click on it, it something will happen. But uh, so these are basically the semantics that you know uh, the. Some examples of the semantic tags are label, header, footer, and these uh, uh, semantic tags I will be using in uh, the code that I have, and let's see how it goes. One simple rule that I have taken, uh, one example that I have taken is we have to use buttons for buttons. We don't, we should not use divs or span for the you know buttons. I'll show that example uh, in the next slide. Okay. Um, the next thing that I will discuss about is uh, tab index. So basically, uh, the clickable items like button or checkboxes, these these are focusable items by default. You don't have to do anything. Tab index is one attribute which you can use to you know um, create focus on the elements that are not by default focusable, like a simple div element. It can never be focusable until and unless you know if you want to. Uh, you know, go uh, you move your cursor on or move your focus on to that particular div, uh, that particular element. So yeah, tab index is one attribute that you can use to you know uh, uh, make that uh, you know focusable. How we'll do it? I will uh, show it in the demo. So basically, in my uh, implementation, I will show you two forms A and B. A is a highly accessible form, which uh, you know has all the accessibility features, and B is a normal form. And we'll be, you know, operating through the keyboard only. We will not use the mouse. Uh, you know, when we are navigating through the form, and you know how we can operate the form only using uh, keyboard. I'll also show, you know, how to trap the focus. Uh, you know, when we are opening a pop-up, you know, how why it's important, and uh, you know how we can implement it. And uh, there are certain other things that we, I will uh, know, like for example, uh, there is a label tag, right? Label is basically a name for any element. So why uh, when we had the label and why uh, area label was required? So yeah, I will show that as well. And then we have I have another example in which uh, I'll show what's the difference between uh, a button and a div with role equals to button, and then how can you use uh, the tab index? Okay, let's get into some code. Okay, 
these are the they are these are two ugly looking buttons i'm sorry for the css but i'm just using it for the example so when you see this you'll see that um they they look the same uh, if anyone would say they would say like yeah these are two buttons if i click on the you know let's say the first one uh showing the console yeah, i clicked on the first button and if i go and click on the second one it's going on it's it's going to say click on the second so it's just a uh, check that i have added so but if i tell you that these are not buttons but one of them is a button and another one is a div so i'll show you the code yep so basically uh, the first one is a button and the, uh, the second one is a div which has role equals to button now button itself comes with a lot of features you know uh, if i okay let me go back to the screen and if i focus on it and click on enter it's going to show uh, it's going to it's it's going to you know it's going to work but for the divs which are uh, you know used as a uh, you know as a button they don't have this feature so we have to explicitly add those things inside that so that we can use it uh, you know uh, as a as a button so like here i have added the rule as button this which is the most important thing uh why i will uh, show you in a bit then we have to you know the on click handler there is one that what will happen when we when we click on the button but that is not enough you know for the div to act as a button we have to add a key down event which listens to uh, basically uh, the enter key uh, which which is basically doing uh, when we hit on enter key when we are focused on the uh, on the on the button then it should happen it should it should be working something it should be uh, working as a button so um and the third property is the tab index so tab index is basically allowing the div to be you know to get focused let me show you if i remove the tab index from here and i'll add a uh, one more button okay so now if i press on tab the first button gets focused and then if i click on second uh, second time the tab you'll see it doesn't go to the uh, to the second button so it's basically uh, i'm showing you the uh, use of tab index that you have to you can use it um, you know to uh, act you know make a div as you know as uh, uh, in the form of a button the next thing that i would like to show is the um on key down uh, feature so basically that if even if you add the role equals to button it will not work uh, you know it will uh, you if you press enter on that uh, you basically won't see any results so let me add it real quick okay so now if i focus on this and hit on enter nothing happens and that is because there is no action defined to you know uh, to respond to the enter uh, button uh, enter click uh, when we are doing on this but if i go to the, uh, the to the button the default button if i hit on enter you see it's working so that is one way of you know creating uh, you know a div uh, as a button and you know operating it now i will show you what role equals to button does and that is the uh, more important part so <coughs> let me switch on the narrator so before i switch on the narrator uh, for visually impaired people uh, what happens is since they can't see what's going on on the screen a uh, default narrator is you know present uh, for macbook or for apple products it's uh, it's it's voice over and for windows it's uh, microsoft narrator and vda jaws so when we turn on you know these uh, screen readers it will basically read out what exactly is on the screen it doesn't matter what you have put there but it will read out what you have assigned the value it so if i for example if uh, let it, let's keep this as a role equals to button and i don't know if you will able to hear this okay but you'll able to see what exactly it's showing so if i click on tab you see it's click me button and if i again click on tab it's again click me button but what happens if i just remove this role equals to button so now if 
I sh uh, focus on this, it will be a button. But if I press on tab, it says click me group. So basically when somebody is operating your, uh, your, you know, seeing your website, they won't understand that uh, you know what it is. It, they are saying they, they must be a, some some con, uh, kind of a heading or some kind of a paragraph or some kind of group which has uh, you know uh, check boxes or something. So it basically confuses. You know it it doesn't serve the purpose. So yeah, that's the that's one use of uh, you know row equals to button. Okay, let's move on to the next part. Switch off this. Okay. Okay. So first, I'll be showing you uh, basically the form which is not accessible. Uh, and again, apologies for the CSS. It's the ugliest looking form that you can see as a front end developer, but it will serve the purpose. So when you see this form, and let's say just whatever you you know when you are seeing this for the first time, you see it's a, it's like a registration form. And let's say I add my details like anything on this and uh, you know just put this here put fill in all the values and click on submit it will open up a pop-up that uh, I'll show you want to submit and if I click on yes it will show the values the values that we have entered uh, yeah it works fine it works you know when we are using uh, it uh, via mouse it works completely fine but what happens if I use it you know, if I operate it only using keyboard. So now, I will be using only via keyboard. If I press on tab, it goes for to the first element, uh, then to the email, to the preferred framework, then city, then submit. And if I click on submit, it will open the pop-up. But now, when it opens the pop-up, basically, you want the user to know that the pop-up has opened, right? But you see the focus is still on the submit button. It doesn't, it doesn't go out of that submit button. It has to go, you know, to the pop-up. So now if I press on tab again, it will go to the reset button. This is not something that you want your user to face because when he clicks on submit, either he has to, you know, hear something like close this dialog button or are you sure you want to submit something like that. But if you don't, uh, you know, uh, if it doesn't go to there, if it's still showing the submit button, then it's, it's not going to be, you know, a useful thing. So now if I press on tab, then it goes to the cancel button. Now again, this pop-up is basically, uh, we add a cross icon right on the right top corner, uh, you know, so basically the first focus should always be the cancel button so that someone when someone who hears it, it should be, you know, they should close, they can close the dialogue. So now when, when we are on the cancel button, then we go on yes, uh, then the, we go on the second option no. And now if I press on tab, the focus goes out. Now, how does the user know that the focus is going out? Uh, he doesn't know. He will hear something like uh, the title name. So that will be, uh, you know, a bad user experience. So now I will show you the form that is uh, fully accessible. Um, five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Yeah. Okay. So now we. What, what we are doing is we are going to use the same way we are going to operate it via keyboard and you know let's see what happens when we you know submit the form so now let's see I enter the name the email and let's say we choose the uh, framework and then uh, by the way I'm using uh, the tab key to operate through all of it I am not using uh, my mouse and then we go on submit and when I hit enter you see it goes to cancel that's how it should be because now the user knows that a dialogue has opened now how the user knows let me show you very quick if i open the narrator app if i click on submit it show it says submit button main it say, it says main because it's in the uh, main element so if i click on submit the first thing that the user will hear is close this dialog button are you sure you want to submit click yes to confirm no to go back so basically the user will hear this and he will understand that okay a pop-up has opened and you know uh, it, it basically is asking whether you want to submit it or not. Now one thing if you notice that if I clicked on submit you see you're seeing click yes to confirm no to go back to the form but you can't see it on the screen. 
obviously but when because when you are uh, you know uh, designing a pop up you don't want uh, so much of extra text to be there so this is achieved by using area label and if i show you here if i go to form a this is the one let me turn it off and yes so this this is basically uh, you know the main function of area label uh, the property we, we you know we can use this property to you know uh, we can write anything on the on the screen and that will be perfect for you know according to whatever the space is there whatever the design is there but we can do we can write anything that speaks out by the narrator so that is uh, you know one of the most uh, you know advantages of area label and here i will explain one more thing uh, uh, that is label versus area label so uh, you know you cannot always add you know label is basically uh, you know adding you know, a basically a name for what your focus is on so like like uh, let's say for this example this input element which has the uh, you know the name so for that uh, you know the label will be uh, you know the name so it's always recommended to use a label with whenever you are using the forms uh for and okay now this is done um since we have lesser time i will uh, just quickly show one more thing and then you can conclude the talk so we have a few testing tools uh, that you know we can test our accessibility through uh, for example uh, ax dev tools lighthouse wave personally i would recommend uh, you know i use ax uh, it's only because i have used only ax and i have only seen lighthouse you know operated by others and then you know we have already discussed about the screen readers you know that are there like for windows and at an nvd and um i will just quickly show one more demo uh, for the form so how to use the ax dev tool uh, you go here and you have to install the ax and you just create a scan of all page you know right now it's showing uh, zero issues uh, that's because everything is uh, implemented correctly uh, we are using a main uh, heading we are using a title which is form a uh, and we are also using uh, you know the uh, the label elements and uh, everything so if i go here and if i just remove this label very quick and if i run the this again it will show the error the form elements must have labels so this is this is how you can use obviously you can we can always improve you know and find uh, the more we use the more we'll understand this um i think that's pretty much it talking about uh, my social presence i am easily accessible just type in shlok sri anywhere and you will find me yep that's it thank you okay questions or no yep thank you thanks all let's see what arrives this time hopefully not any network issues okay finally <laughs> anyway guys uh not just the network troubles like say five good talks and a very good crowd uh what else is more exciting than this so uh, about the last talk i really liked it uh, basically even the last meetup we had something similar to this like say uh, it's not about like we learning about the accessibility right it's pretty easy like say uh, uh <coughs> oh, we are writing uh, pretty good apps performing well and uh, this is for people who are like uh, having no challenges in terms of uh, visibility or so on uh, so it is pretty easy for them uh, and it is pretty tough for the developer to take care of their user actions like they can click the mouse down mouse up there is a lot of events but in case of uh, visually challenged people uh, it's pretty easy to make the site accessible it's not just about the uh, uh, 
what you call the toughness or the challenges that we uh, face to make a site accessible it's all about to have that empathy uh, to make your app inclusive for your uh, fellow mates who are like say visually challenged so please have that uh, empathy just build something which is really inclusive and uh, yeah just he showed about uh, uh, acts the dev tools but i would suggest to add something in your build pipeline don't tell your manager or maybe yeah just tell him that it makes the site faster so or maybe <laughs> say something else yeah just add something like uh, just acts which can block you in the unit test uh it will make you fail if you are not adding the accessibility just do something here just make it uh, inclusive not just for uh, like say uh, we as people may uh, have that empathy and you should enforce or force that empathy to your fellow colleagues right so just do that uh, let me get started like say i will not take too much time i will just make it quick i do not have any demos thank you yeah so i'm santosh and uh, today's topic it's going to be the pnpm uh, a not so new package manager and you can these are my twitter and uh, linkedin handles i'm pretty much active there and i work for this company called rubric uh, as a software engineer mostly on the ui ui infra sometimes uh, yeah that's pretty much it me uh, improving the performance uh, like say getting into the network tab and seeing which bundle is taking more time trying to reduce the size of the bundle or maybe chunking it down more uh, maybe focus more on uh, what can improve the uh, like say the uh, <coughs> page load time faster these are my uh, everyday work uh, yeah having said that uh, this package manager uh, pnpm is not so uh, new uh, like say uh, how many of you use package manager oh, what kind of a dumb question is it right so everybody <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it's a react meetup and nothing works without packages and pretty much the entire ecosystem is in open source and packages are bread and butter for each and every react dev Uh, so basically i will just take a minute to uh, start with uh, advertising my company maybe next time when i prepare for this meetups i will get uh, a half a day of time to spend maybe yeah uh, so basically uh, basically we secure the workloads that are running in your data centers um, or even in your clouds or whatever it is like say you don't want to have a backup admin who takes care of backing up at a particular interval of time or so on and so forth you configure it forget about it and when there is some ransomware attack or something like a disaster which happens to your actual data you can just get it out uh, within a minute with using rubric let's get started yeah as i said it's not so new it's just the first release you can just see it it's in 2016 august uh and let's just see the like say how it got evolved no uh like uh, how we got uh, evolved from the monkeys apes whatever neanderthals yeah so uh, basically like from the npm 2 we got forked off ied you can just see that uh, repository is still alive no there is no maintenance but still you can see the github repository that is a package manager that is meant for concurrent uh, resolving of packages uh, you can just check it out that is forked from npm 2 and this pnpm has some npm 3 related changes also but not completely but uh, pnpm uh, is like a fork from that and uh, yarn you know uh, most probably many of the people would have used it uh, yeah maybe let's just have a quick look at the comparison no like say the top most line is the npm which has the most popularity and like this shows the downloads the number of downloads that has happened over the period of time and uh, the second line is yarn and the third one is pnpm and you know like say from 2016 it is a very uh, shallow curve for pnpm and uh, it has started getting the traction <coughs> since the last few years and you can see that exponential growth and uh, this i feel is because of the problems that we faced from uh, yarn and npm as increased a lot over the period of time uh, i will go through like say what are the problems that these package managers the old ones has and not old like the uh, peer ones have and what how the uh, pnpm solves it and uh, yeah so basically right uh, this pnpm is not a new one 
it has been there for a so long and the architecture how it handles this node modules folder is what very cheeky i liked it so much and it's very cute i would say and uh, this uh, npm like i hate it dude uh, i do not know how many of you hate it i hate npm a lot and uh, like see you know npm is like the official package manager uh, by node js for so many years now and uh, like say yarn it is uh, developed by facebook and it is now maintained by the open source community and since it is a pretty big uh, company back so it has tra- it has a lot of traction with marketing and so on and so forth they called it so fast but it is not as fast as they uh, said it ha- it should be or it would be uh, but this pnpm is really fast trust me just give it a try just go just try to uninstall your <laughs> existing package managers or maybe keep it with core pack node js has something called core pack where you can just specify the package manager that you are going to use try to do like core pack is so cool but it's experimental don't use it in production don't get fired yeah but yeah uh, it's experimental just try it out in your local machine just try to use multiple package managers here and there but just give it a try to this pnpm it's so good um with yarn being like that pnpm who's backing that pnpm didn't uh, haven't been backed up by a pretty huge company uh, till for like say recent years uh, recently bit.dev has uh, like say given a lot of support for pnpm how many of you know about this bit.dev it's a cool project yaar yeah. like say it's open source cool yeah nice one so basically just give it a try so basically it doesn't require git it doesn't require package managers it doesn't require babel for transpiling it doesn't require uh, any webpack or something like bundlers nothing you require nothing you just require bit.dev and that's it like but again it it has a paid version and the open source version i do not know whether it has all the features but uh, just maybe explore it uh using it or not that will be a separate deal but uh, bit.dev is a good project you can just give it a try they are supporting it and they are internally using pnpm a lot uh, they are not using a direct pnpm uh, <coughs> package manager but they have something like a wrapper around it but they support a lot of uh, pnpm related stuff uh yeah so let's just see you no know, like what is pnpm it's just performant npm just that and uh, there is one open source contributor is very active and he's he's the one who termed this uh, name and uh, like say they call it as the first uh, or fast uh, disk space efficient package manager so if you take the ied which was the previous fork of npm2 it is just focused on the speed the fastness but this one has two problem solutions and those are one is regarding the speed and another one is regarding the space utilization uh you know how hard is to have that node modules in your thing like say in your machine you just think of deleting it and it take years to delete even and copying is never in the picture at all come on and yeah uh, so basically the structure of the node modules has changed uh we will see each one of them later but just get to know the terms there is something called hoisted node modules we the pnpm has come up with isolated node modules and caching mechanism there was a version based caching and uh, here it has content addressable storage uh dependency installation it was synchronous before stage based and now it is become more async uh just quickly guys five more minutes i will just get it done uh <coughs> this uh, hoisted node modules right this is a pretty important problem you will not face it uh, like until or unless uh, like say you have a bad day or do something like that right so basically uh, just see the structure of the node modules right like say how the folder looks like when i install uh, express so let's consider the left side is i'm using npm the right side i'm using pnpm right so left side i have the dependency express just express right it's like a node mo- node server you can just read about it it's a good one and uh, yeah so basically i write it and you can see all these dependencies are added automatically so and it's added in a flat hierarchy right you see everything will be inside the node modules how it happens this is called transitive dependencies i install express and express may have something like cookie and cookie may have something like cookie signature and it goes on and everything comes under the flat hierarchy so now what happens is 
let's come to the npm pnpm later but let's see how what will be the problem right so the problem is like here if i do import cookie from cookie it will work in case of npm but pnpm it will throw error but i will tell you why later but just think of tomorrow if express stops using this cookie okay so initially you will not face any trouble everything will work fine locally you go to the production everything will work but once you upgrade something some change happens done done and uh, the thing is and you do not have any control over what version of the library is using and maybe you just check out like say some of my previous talks around this node modules the problem around the security vulnerability uh, which has given in the same react meetup like maybe couple of months ago uh yeah uh, so just check it out like say you have vulnerability in the open source ecosystem and uh, with these kind of unknown like running unknown scripts in your local machine you will get like say unimaginable uh, security problems right so yeah i do not agree with data privacy <laughs> thing that he told but anyway yeah i i am just so uh, cautious about my data Uh, let's see how this isolated node modules work right uh, say uh, what happens is with uh, pnpm the node module structure changes like this right so basically i have a express and from express internally the express folder in the node modules will not have anything it is just a sim link right it's just a sim link system link and symbolic link sorry it's a symbolic link and that will be in like the actual express folder will be inside the pnpm dot pnpm right and all the transitive dependencies like cookie and everything will go under that particular folder in which the express actually resides and that cookie will not have that cookie folder inside the express will not be the actual folder where the code is there it will again be a symbolic link to the actual uh, cookie folder in the pnpm repository like the folder so the flat hierarchy is maintained but the nested uh, structure of the symbolic links creates your safer environment so now if you do something like import cookie from cookie you will be thrown error because the node modules folder doesn't have that cookie right this is clear right am i clear guys so this is a pretty cool uh, or a pretty uh, worst or dumb bug that we had in npm but we are not having it in pnpm right so it's a very cool one and uh, let's just think about it once again right say let's consider i have some version of it here some version of some uh, package here and that is vulnerable and i have no control about it if it is a npm uh, thing right i just go do import cookie from cookie it can steal your cookie and then send it to some other page i have no control over it but now i clearly need to specify which version of the uh, package i'm using which package i'm using and then only i will be able to use it and you will not have any these kind of dumb bugs and you don't want to spend your time or spend your friday night in this yeah let's just see you no know, how it helps in the mono repo architecture so uh, so don't ask me like say why would you go for a mono repo with uh, multiple packages inside there is some <laughs> possible examples yeah so basically when you have a mono repo which has packages inside and uh, it should be able to used by some external parties also in that case you definitely need packages inside your mono mono repo so basically i can see a lot of people come up with this kind of questions like say it's a mono repo and why do you want to have packages there you can just write everything in a single react app right so but still if you want some packages to be uh, available for the external parties to be consuming it so we will just go with the mono repo with packages thing inside it but now see here in with npm right what happens is like say uh, the you know the node module folder will have dependencies of foo and dependencies of var bar foo and bar are two packages which are like i am writing right inside that mono repo and uh, all the dependencies are coming inside that uh, node modules folder and it's pretty easy for us to uh, just get into that kind of a bug where i import a, a foo related package inside a bar package right and in case of pnpm that is segregated separately the foo de de dependencies and the bar dependencies are seg segregated separately and what happens is you will not be able to import the dependencies of bar inside foo or the vice versa right 
and uh, this problem is pretty more uh, like in a smaller uh, size or the number of instances will be very less but still it will be uh, hard to maintain when it comes uh, to a pretty big complex uh, react app say we have a pretty big react app and it has tons of code in it and if we are not minding something like this we will be in trouble right and uh, <coughs> let's just move on the disk space right i just love adding this slides you can just see this slide in my like couple of talks also before so basically i do not like the node modules i hate it to the core more than i hate my ex yeah anyway <laughs> yeah so uh, this is like the size of the node modules is so huge root like say you cannot uh, compare it with any other uh, like say you think of any uh, maybe there are people who have worked on other languages also right like say java uh, maybe you would have worked with gradle or maven or uh, people who have worked on python would have worked on pip or any language you take any package manager this is the biggest folder that the package manager can build right so the next one so how the pnpm solves it right so this has something like content addressable storage for each and every so okay i will tell you how the npm does the caching right first so basically let's consider uh, in npm i have two packages of different versions like hello world 1.1 or uh, hello world 1.1.0 so whatever it is right so it will never like say compare or uh, think about what is the content inside the versions or whatever it is it just copies the folder it just downloads the folder if the version is changing i will keep it in my local machine and then whenever i want you can just create a symbolic link inside your project or whatever it is right so <coughs> that is how it works and uh, but in case of pnpm it goes through the content it creates a hash for each and every content in the file so if you see the, the three files uh the index.js files inside all the three versions of hello world are the same so pnpm doesn't care about what version it is it creates a hash and then creates in the global uh, store of pnpm in your local machine it creates a hash file that hash file will be used in all of these references okay here are we using system links uh, sorry symbolic links no here we are not using symbolic links we are using hard links uh maybe people who doesn't know okay maybe i will just give a glimpse of it maybe it is a separate topic which needs a separate lecture though but yeah i will just give a glimpse of it uh, so basically like uh, symbolic links are just like a mapping you have one file uh, path that will be mapped to some other file path right you don't care about what is there inside the file content if you delete this it's done that's it you modify the content it doesn't care it just executes that right and if there is any change in the metadata say you are changing the file permissions doesn't care like say it will just execute it just tries to execute the same file it's just a mapping right but in case of hard links it's a pretty different one it's like it's a copy of the inode uh, inode uh, uh, like say if you are from this posix file systems or uh, uh, operating systems you would know that so basically i know it is like a copy of or a mirror copy of all your file related data like say the metadata file permissions uh, who created it the date of editing all these things right and whatever you edit in the file a which is like a mirror of file b whatever you do here that will be the copy of that right like say there like the content will not be copied but the entire metadata and everything is like a copy of it it's like think of like a uh, mirror kind of a thing where it's just a reflection of it like not exactly the uh, it is a file it's not a, just a mapping i will just complete two minutes yeah yeah i know <laughs> anyway uh let's get uh to the next one yeah so basically if you see try to visualize how it would be it would be like in this structure like say i create project a and i create project b and there is a lot of content which are like uh, uh, the same it is just the pointers the i notes will be the present will be present inside the project folder and uh, nothing else right no nothing and uh, say for example hard links i think will work for windows uh, mac and linux 
it's all good uh will work for windows i am not so sure, sure about it maybe you can google it but uh, symbolic links it will not work with windows uh instead there we use something called junctions you can just search for it you can find more about it yeah <coughs> um so what this slide i why i kept it is like say over the period of time when you create more and more projects right at the end when you like say after some 40 project 50 project whatever the threshold is the number of content you are actually downloading from the internet or the number of content you are actually copying or like say trying to replicate and then getting your node models bigger and bigger in your five mission is not going to happen at all it's just going to get your uh, disk usage to zero like say i create the app no other uh, space is being occupied apart from my source code space right so that is what we are trying to achieve with pnpm and the speed comparison just see look at the numbers like say the pnpm is the least and uh, yarn is somewhat near but not so much yarn pnp not so near i see uh, but anyway uh, but yarn pnp is not so much adopted just think of that these are the benchmarks that are provided in the uh, pnpm uh, like say so the site and there is a link which has better more uh, visualization of these benchmarks you can just check it out and uh, okay so how it, we know it is faster right how it is faster so basically in the P npm world or in the yarn world how it happens is first uh, package or json is resolved to package log dot json or yarn log dot json whatever it is and then the fetching happens it downloads and then again the linking the symbolic links are created inside the uh, node modules for npm or yarn but in case of pnpm doesn't care i will just i will just have one package at once just get it resolved get it fetched get it in my local mission get it in my project repository symlink that's it and then i will go on for the next one so and these are like separate concurrent processes doesn't care about like say whether the other one is completed or not and with this parallelization and the degree of parallelization that depends on your mission it will be so fast if you are running in a eight core mission you can expect this to be lightning fast so uh, just give it a try guys like say this is so cool and we just migrated to pnpm recently and we are loving it and like we have a ton of dependencies and uh, uh, transitive dependencies in our react app and we do use mono repo we have multiple packages in our react app just all all kind of complexity you want star on our app and we were still able to migrate it with some minimized efforts but still it is worth it uh, it it increases the developer productivity a lot uh, and that's it guys thank you so much i loved the crowd seriously i was able to see people standing over like say when i came inside like say at the end but it was so cool a uh, lot of known faces few unknown faces i'm liking it so loving it a lot any questions if you have just like meet me offline kiran will kill me otherwise yeah thank you so much this is an interesting read there is a faq you can just check it out this is like you cannot find it in most of the other package managers or the other websites uh, this has a faq and then just check it out there are some interesting questions and answers as well thank you so much bye bye Uh, hi everyone. Uh, so I think if you don't mind, we can have a picture before we leave. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think we haven't announced the next meetup. Uh, it will be most probably on March. Sorry, uh, on 15th April. Uh, hopefully at Flipkart, uh, we'll announce the event. And if you want to present at that meetup, you can propose a talk as well. Uh, also, we are having a conference in July and. You can also propose a talk for that as well. Uh, CFP for the conference is open.
So if you want to speak at the conference, you can propose it. Thank <laughs> you. 